The scientific revolution starts now. Have you ever read J- uh, Michener's Hawaii? Mm-mm. I was obsessed with that book as a kid. It's one of those, like, each chapter is about a different generation in Hawaii. Hmm. And the first chapter, which is like five pages long, is about the volcanoes. I've never read it. I've read the whole thousand page book probably 20 times. Love this book. Um, because, like, the first chapter is about Polynesian people. And they're in one place and they're dealing with all their issues and all their dramas and how they end up in Hawaii. And then the next one is about the missionaries and how their dramas and how they and they interact with the whalers and they interact with the descendants of the previous chapter hmm. or the older versions of the previous chapter hmm. as it goes on and on. And there's Japanese immigrants and Chinese immigrants. And, and it's just like, and then it has this, Big old chart in the beginning, because then it's not only all the characters, but all their children and grandchildren, great grandchildren Mm. interact with the new characters in the next chapter. And then their children interact with the new generation. You're just like, okay, I got it. That's my favorite kind of of, uh, long form story is the ones that take place across time. Have you read my book? Mm -mm. Do you know I have a book? We mm-hmm. know that you have a book, but we have not read it. I, didn't, I actually didn't know. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Why would you know? Um, so I, the reason I started this podcast, I'm sorry, started the YouTube channel mm-hmm. is because I started writing a book. And I asked my friend, the same one who said I look terrible, in my first recording of the video. And I'm like, what do I do? Do I start a blog? How do I get people to read it? Because I was sure I was almost done with my book. This was seven years ago. <laughs> and uh, my book just came out. That's mm-hmm. so no. Um, book writing, I'm sorry to tell you, is such a long process. Yeah, yeah, we're feeling it. What's the um, book but, about? Um, the book is my motivation for the video. So what happened was I wrote a book about how I I had a conversation with a woman who told me she was too stupid to understand electricity and broke my heart. So I explained to her the basics of how we generate electricity. And she was so excited to just feel like she could understand the basics that I realized that I, that that there was this need for people to feel like they had some control over their world. Mm. That like, I would say 80% of the population doesn't understand the basics of physics and it scares them. And I'm not wanting the world to be all physicists. That would be awful. (laughs) Too many ideas. But we, I feel like we can, uh, just the fear of physics keeps us from thinking. And then we can't learn something new because we're petrified. I had this student, she couldn't tell me whether seconds was time, distance, or speed. I'm like, that isn't ignorance. That is panic. Mm. And when it comes to physics, so many people, adults and, I mean, this woman was a lawyer. She's a high price, went to college, went to grad school, clearly intelligent. And she called herself stupid. And so many people tell me they're stupid. Mm. And it drives me nuts. It just makes me sad and angry and mostly sad. I just want, I mean, like, it gives me such joy to know how the world works. And I'd like other people to have that joy, you know? And so, like, I thought, well, I was interested in the history of science. I thought, oh, I'll study the history of science and teach electricity through its history. That way they can learn it in a nice, easy way. And I can learn some history because obviously I don't need to learn any more physics. Clearly, I know it all. (laughs) At least the basics. I figured I knew it. I got it down. And then almost immediately it was like, 
wow, I never thought of this. How do they figure out electricity flows? <laughs> How do they fill conductors from insulators? How do they figure out why did Benjamin Franklin call it positive and negative? Why did he get it wrong? Was he important? Did he fly a kite? And yeah, he did fly a kite. What was your like, background? Was your background in physics before that? Were you oh, w- yes. working in the academy or? No, I was. Um, I studied uh, physics at the University of Chicago, and I was just thinking about how brutal the education was. It was just last night talking to my friend who went to physics there, and it it was one of those departments that was like it starts off with like two hundred kids, like pre meds, mm-hmm. and we they whittled us down to twenty, and it was just like. Everything was intense. The first quiz I got back, I was like, I think I did okay. I get it. I get it 22%. I was looking out of a, I've never seen that grade on a test for anyone ever. I never even got the 22% in French. Like, <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, I guess I'm doing something. <laughs> and then he came up and he's like, You guys did badly. The average was 20. It's a B. Yeah, like, yeah. And I, we were just talking about, I don't know if that was that trimester at the end of the year. I can't remember which one it was. But we got this final exam, like six problems. I looked through, I can't figure out how to answer any of them. I can't figure out how to start any of them. I'm just flipping through, and I look around. Not a single person had picked up their pencil or pen. Not a single person. Then, and I'd forgotten this part, my friend Tom turned around and threw up in his backpack. <laughs> and oh my then God. it triggered something. No. He starts furiously writing. My other friend, Ed, who was on a full scholarship, which had a grade requirement, stood up and said, fuck this, I quit. Whoa. <laughs> and walked out of the room in the middle of the final. And my Memory is he flipped off the professor, but I think that's a romantic in me. He might have. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this probably explains the physics anxiety of most people. I think everybody has had some some minor version of this in their you know first encounters with physics. But was this, I think was this undergrad op- or grad? Undergrad. This is undergrad. Wow. Freshman, eighteen years old, because they were treating us like it was boot camp. They were like. You guys are going to be the elite team of physics, and we're going to make it as freaking. We want to see this, but they didn't say it explicitly. They just gave us impossible problems. They made it impossible. They, it was just ludicrous. But they forgot to tell us when we were done that we were really smart. Mm. You know, they kept on telling us. They're like, when we're done, they're like, wait till you get to grad school, then you really realize that you know nothing. It's like. If you're going to make it like, you know, elite team of thing and you drown people and beat them up at the end, you're like, you're amazing, right? You got to build people up sometimes. <laughs> but they didn't. They never did. They just told us we were crap. That's wild. And I mean, I know so many pro- people. I mean, most of the people I know from there became professors, usually in physics. And they all feel insecure. <laughs> Every physics professor feels insecure. And it's because we won't, when we're professors, we won't, because we feel insecure, we won't admit that we're confused about things, that it takes a while to come to ideas. That the most beautiful, clear idea takes a little while. That's been something that we've really run across on the podcast a lot, which is that we have to be very gentle in conversations about physics because we'll start asking questions about fundamental things. Uh Uh-huh. And people get really a little bit freaked out, a little bit nervous, because you can tell that you're coming up against something that maybe they learned a long time ago, but they haven't really thought about in depth. Or you're asking them a question that, that that's presented in a way that's not the usual form in which they've heard it. And so you can see the panic at the right. thought of having to say, hey, I don't actually know. Right. Or I haven't thought about it that way. And it's really interesting to me because I wouldn't have expected it to be so. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to record this because that's my whole thing. It just hit me like 
literally two days ago of just like, I know why we're like this. I know. I feel like we've been misinterpreting the Dunning Kruger. I keep on looking at it to make sure I'm saying it right. Dunning Kruger effect so badly, so badly from the very beginning because of the Dunning Kruger effect. Mm. Yeah, break that down because a lot of people use the Dunning Kruger effect to tell other people that they don't know what they're talking about, something like that. Right. that that's usually where I hear it. Right. It, it usually means it's interpreted as stupid people think they're smart, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then, oh, we should record this. We should record this. Yeah, yeah, we're, we've been recording this whole time. So. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> uh, hold on. I do want to say, though, really quickly, let's do, I'm going to do an alignment clap. Uh -huh. And can you say Max Planck? Oh my gosh, Max! Am I supposed to say it right? No, it doesn't I matter. I just, I just, need, I, I just need the P. I just need the P. Oh, Max Planck. Perfect. Nice. Okay. Yeah, we use it to align the audio. Oh, see, I usually pronounce it as Max Planck because I was learned learned it from Americans, and now <laughs> I always when I get to that word, I'm like Max P P Planck, and. <laughs> Oh, I, I have say, a story I say about just Max being American. Planck. Just being an American. Yeah. So I made this video about Max Planck, which makes me sound like I'm faking it. And um, I did this video about Max Planck, and someone said, "It's oh, interesting video. Shame he had his humor surgically removed." And I was like, "Oh no!" Because you look at pictures of him, and he looks like the grumpiest of grumps. He really does. He looks like. I don't know. You have to look up a picture of him and then you and you realize he is not he was not a photogenic man. <laughs> and but he when he won a Nobel Prize, he gave a delightful speech and he converted it into a, a short scientific autobiography. And I recommend absolutely everyone read it. Hmm. It's like 20 pages long, which is the right length for an autobiography. It is hilarious it is understandable for anyone at any level and like he had this description about how he fell in love with the first law of thermodynamics that heat and work and energy are all related to each other because he said a high school teacher told him to imagine a worker lifting a heavy object onto a ledge and then you think well all that work is wasted it's just there but it's not gone. It's just stored. And maybe someday someone will walk down the street and get bopped in the head by that stone. And then they'll find that energy wasn't gone. It was there the whole time. Hmm. Nice. And I was like, this guy is hilarious. This guy is. And everyone said it. I think Lisa Meitner or Lisa Meitner. See, I can't pronounce anyone's name. Said something like. He brightened the room when he showed it up. And he, he used to do these marathon games of tag with everyone. And no one could beat him. Like, he was the fastest runner. And he was just <laughs> such a delight. And the, the thought of all these scientists, all these famous scientists and their children racing around and squealing with delight about playing tag. Like, this guy was adored. And... And getting into that story of who he was rather than what he looked like was so much fun, although so sad. Because, man, just such a sad story. I mean, his wife dies of tuberculosis, and then his one of his twin daughters dies in childbirth, and then her sister comes to live with the husband to take care of the child. She falls in love. She dies in childbirth. It's and the one son gets captured during World War One. The other son dies in World War One. Then the son who was captured gets released. But then in World War Two, when they did the attack on Hitler and didn't win, uh, didn't succeed. You know, they blew it up. They tried to blow him up. I think mm -hmm. July twentieth yeah. or something. They had a bomb. And they tried to kill him, but yeah. they just pissed him off. And he, after that, Hitler is like, round up everyone, torture everyone. He's like, 10,000 people get tortured or kidnapped, including the other son of Max Planck. Oh, oh. my God. 
And he was like, and Planck was desperate. He's like, help me. All these people, like reaching out to all these people who he hates. He hated Hitler. And he hated Himmler. He hated all this garbage. But he's like, please, you know, I'm a nobody. Please do something for my son. And Himmler's like, yeah, we got it. We'll let him go. The next day they kill him. I'm like, ugh. It's just like your heart bleeds. And he was, and he was, he also, when he heard that they weren't going to let Jewish scientists teach and work in Germany, he went to Hitler himself and he said, you can't do this. You will destroy German science. And Hitler went, Aah. he said that Hitler was so crazy, such a delusional mess. He was just like, so defeated, but also like, this guy is not going to stay in power. He's clearly bonkers. And that was his big mistake. But he never, I mean, Lisa Meitner said, he, he visited her. And he said, terrible things should happen to Germany because we've done terrible things. And she said to her friend, I don't know what he's talking about with this we stuff. This 80-year-old man has done more for Germany and for Jews than anyone else. I think she said more to stand up to Hitler than anyone else. And I'm like, I mean, you could argue what he did and what he didn't do, but man, it's just a... It's just a moving and deep and beautiful and sad story. We really need your help to keep this project improving, growing, becoming better and more powerful. And to get better guests and have better conversations, please come over to patreon.com slash demystify sci and join our inner circle. Get together with us every week and help us develop this project. Also, share the project with somebody, you know? Maybe you know somebody who could benefit from a conversation like this. Share it with them, you know? We're not able to pull this off with YouTube algorithms alone. We don't fit into any camp really easily. We're having people from all sides of the discussion. So share it with people, please. Leave a comment down below. Come over to Discord. Come over to Facebook. Give us your ideas. We really depend on an interaction with you guys. If you've already done that, maybe consider blocking off your calendar for next April 6th and 7th. We're having our very first Demystify Sci conference in Austin, Texas, which will coincide with the eclipse that is passing directly overhead. It's going to be a really exciting weekend. We have some incredible speakers lined up. So, you know, look at your calendar, see what you can do. Otherwise, enjoy the conversation. We'll see you later. I think it's super important for people to understand the lives of the people that have really succeeded in the arts and sciences because I think there's so much more to it than them having really good ideas. And I think that that's unfortunately what most people associate with what it takes to succeed in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that at least half of the battle is being a really good person that fits into the community that you're working in and being, you know, giving some some life to that community and, and really being a collaborator and being someone who moves things forwards in in off of the record too, right? It's like there's you can have a great idea, but you have to bring that into fruition to make it useful in the world right. of science. You need I'm, to work with other people. Yes and no. What happens is is that ideas don't come from one person's brain. Right. And they don't come fully formed. But not all collaboration is personal. Often collaboration is I read this paper, I read that paper, I saw that experiment, and I mixed it together in a blender, and I came up with this idea. And then someone else saw it. most of it is BS, but I like this part. And then they grew this part. And then someone else said, no, 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 more of it's correct. No, less is correct. No, and expanded it. It's a river of ideas. Mm. We have this image, um, Marie Skolodowska Curie, she liked to go by her full name, um, liked to say, that people think ideas emerge fully formed, like Minerva emerging from Zeus's head. Mm. But they don't. They take so much work and they take so much effort. And the more sim simple your solution is, the more work it took. I'm adding that from that. And so, for, so there is intense collaboration in terms of every idea that came out. But often it's across continents, it's across decades, it's across. So some people work best working with a bunch of other people. Some people work best by themselves. There's all sorts of different styles of work. 
And you'd think that scientists would all be naturally collaborative, but sometimes scientists are horrible people or become horrible people. And we're like, well, they weren't a good scientist. But there's a guy named Philip Leonard, fabulous scientist, won a Nobel Prize, was brilliant. And then during World War I, he got in this thing about the ether. See, you'd like that. He was like, I, he wanted, he was upset about J.J. Thompson discovering the electron mm. because Philip Leonard felt like it limited what his discovery was, which is that, um, remember the old cathode ray tubes? Sure. The TVs. Of course. Big, thick TVs. It was a beam of electrons. But they didn't know what it was, right? They weren't using it for television. They're just like, this is this weird beam. And if you put a magnet next to it, it moves. So what is it? Is it light? What the heck is this thing? And Leonard figured out that it could go through a very thin piece of aluminum and be moved just like millimeters off the other side of this. And actually, that's why the x-ray was discovered. Because mm. another guy named Runkin tried it. But he tried it with a, a, a fluorescent screen that worked for x-rays. And Leonard used it for fluorescent screen that didn't work for x-rays. So he didn't see it. And so um, Runkin had this thing. It was all covered. And it just had the aluminum beam. And he turned it on. And he was expecting to see it right in front of the window. And he saw it right in the side of it. He saw it everywhere. And then he started... He, if you read his paper, he's like, and I picked up a book, and I pick up the deck of cards, and I picked up a piece of wood. I mean, he doesn't say pick up, but clearly he's just like grabbing, I mean, a thousand page book, a piece of wood, and he picked up a, a piece of lead that was small, and he's holding it up to the screen to see how long it takes to go through the lead, right? And he starts to see through his hand, but he also starts to see the bones in his hand as he's holding this up. And this was a really weak x-ray. So it must have been like a half hour of him standing there going, wait, wait, are those my bones? Are those my bones? He goes home and he tells his wife, Bertha, he's like, I've discovered something that's going to make everyone say, Runkin has gone crazy. And they they didn't say he would. And then he just studies it in secret for like, he was an amateur photographer. He finds out it develops film. He's doing all this stuff. He, um, he publishes it. And at first no one notices, but he sent a copy to an old student with some photographs. And that guy showed his friend and the friend like ran to his father who owned a um, publishing, a newspaper. And they changed the front page to add this article that says, amazing discovery. And it's so German. It's like, uh, this is real. This sounds like from Jules Verne, but this is real science from a real German scientist. <laughs> yeah. I like that. They're, they're, don't be fooled. This is real. It's German. <laughs> so wait, why, 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 was, uh, why was Leonard so upset about this? Well, Leonard was fine with the x-ray at first. But then he realized that, like, oh, he was fine with the x-ray because he thought he had discovered that um, a, the electron beam was really a new kind of invisible light. And Leonard found an extra kind of invisible light called x-ray. So they're like twinnies, you know, and they're and Leonard writes this letter of like, I'm so excited about the thing. It's your remarkable discovery makes my small discovery look better and we're we're in tandem and I love you and you love me. And then JJ Thompson discovered that the beam was a beam of electrons and electrons can tunnel through thin things. And he's like, no, no, hmm. no, I don't like it. I don't like it. And the reason he didn't like it is because then his discovery was, I just planted the seed and other people pluck the fruit, which is mm. exactly what he said when he won the Nobel prize. <laughs> he's like, I mostly just, set things up and then other people knocked it down. And so he was like, well, if I prove that the electrons are just buckets of ether, mm. then I will take it away from the stupid Englishman. And it was very patriotic. And then it will be me. 
right? And so World War One, he's like, okay, we're going to find the ether. We're going to find the ether. And he gets a grad student named Jacob Laub. I think that's how you pronounce it, who is besties with Einstein. And Einstein at first was like, oh, you're so lucky. doesn't even matter what you get paid. You're working with a great Leonard. The amount that you will do is just going to blow us away. And then pretty soon he's like, the experiments you're doing are stupid. I can't believe he's making you do this. This is awful. <laughs> and then towards the end, Einstein is like, you're lucky. Eventually you'll stop working for this guy. He's going to be stuck with himself for the rest of his life. Wow. wow. And then after the war, Leonard started this big group of anti-Semitic scientists oh, who are no. like, the ether is German science and relativity is Jewish science. Oh, boy. And the reason we lost the war is because of Jewish science. And he wrote books on like three books. This is good German science. This is bad Jewish science. This is other kind of science, which is kind of bad, but at least not as bad as Jewish science. And everyone's like, I guess we just figured out why people gave up on mediators. <laughs> what? There's a political element to it. It seems like. I mean, if you if if the ether is uh, German science and the Germans lost all the wars, then you know, well, it, they, we're deeply anti-Semitic it, to boot. Oh yes, it's completely a hundred percent. It comes from, and so they have started this big group, like. Heisenberg was saying, like, I'm walking down the street and people giving me pamphlets about how the ether is so important and how you're evil. And I'm like, what the hell is this crap? Oh, and so then they found Hitler. And Leonard specifically wrote a paper that uh, for the newspaper that said Hitler is, comes like a gift from the gods. And I, I'm just I'm overjoyed with Hitler. And here, take all of my people that I've gathered on all these meetings of like, we lost the war because of the Jews. Take them all. Yay. And yeah. And so, and, but it's not. And the problem is physics is so confusing that we confu conflate. What's the right words? Sometimes things get popular or unpopular for reasons that have nothing to do with physics. Mm hmm. You know, we're talking a lot about Nikola Tesla, partially because some guy wanted to sell cars. Well, Nikola Tesla has long been a favorite of the fringe community. So we spent a lot of time. Our, our path into this project was through the fringe in some ways, mm -hmm. because at some point we were looking around and doing kind of what you were saying about the collaborations of of old which is that you read a paper or you read a piece and most of it is garbage but there's a little pearl in it mm -hmm. you're like you know what it, this actually this is interesting and this is worth pursuing but it's 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 nested in a sea of of nonsense and right. so we progressively were going through all of these fringe theories and tesla is a, is a huge darling of i would say electric universe people of people who believe that there is a government conspiracy to hide uh, power generation technology from the public because the power companies wouldn't be able to sell it anymore. I mean, his laboratory burned down mysteriously. Like, he's the perfect, you know, fringe Absol darling. And Absolutely. after his and the laboratory burnt down, Westinghouse paid him $196,600. I thought, no, $296,000. I got to look up the number um, because... He was in a patent sharing deal with GE, and so he paid off Tesla for his patents for polyphase and gave him a huge amount of money, which he blew away immediately on everything, including living at the world's fanciest hotel, eating the fanciest food, building these giant things, and then tearing it down and building another giant thing, having a lot of beautiful secretaries and telling them what to wear. Um and Interesting. I always thought of him as a kind of like asexual character. That's, that's... He was, he would not, he was very into um, that he could only do science because he was sort of a monk for science, that one reduces one's essence of science by getting married, mm. by having sex, mm. by the women reduces one's intelligence mm. and Newton in order was kind of like to be that too. Pure, 
one needs to restrain from the the uh, attentions of the weaker sex. And um, that's not uh, what science history says in any way, shape, or form. It's the, the precious of bodily Mary's... fluids theory of, uh, of, yes, <laughs> of, of yes, scientific yes. rigor. Yes, and it was very much like that. Poor Tesla, he honestly was... He had, uh, let me say it a different way. There was a guy named Lucine Gallard, and Lucine Gallard was a French engineer. And one day, Lucine was looking at these coils, these spark coils. They're called Rumkorf coils. And he realized that they had all this machinery to take direct current and convert it into pulses of alternating current. And it would make it much higher voltage, much more dangerous, but also cooler. Like the coils themselves would be cooler. They would make less heat because they had lower current, but higher voltage. And he thought, huh, if we just have alternating current, we could use this backwards. We could make it at the dangerous level and transform it. And produce it at the dangerous level where it doesn't make much heat. Take it long distances and then use the coils backwards to make it safe. And then we could use it for lights and stuff like that. And we could get electricity moving long distances, but only alternating current. And he convinces a guy to give him money for the patent. And he gets a patent in 1882. And <coughs> everyone tells them that they're full of it. They're like, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. This is terrible. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, Siemens of the Siemens company. Werner von Siemens, I think was his name. He's like, this is the purest balderdash or something like that. But then in 1884, they won a, um, like, they won top prize at this fair and they started to get a few contracts including a contract in England and the contract in England. And then other people started paying attention. There's a ZBD group and they made a much better system. It worked a lot better. It was just hard to mass manufacture. And they came up with a bunch of ideas. And um, this guy named Zambini, I think. Don't quote me on that. It's too late. Uh, <laughs> living in England filed for a patent for his own. He said, I can use this stuff without accused, sorry, accused Gallard of not being original because everyone knew this spark machine would make it higher voltage. And Gallard got so stressed and had so much emotional difficulties anyway, he was found on the streets of Paris telling everyone he was a god. And he needs to talk to the president because God does not live. So okay. they take him away to the insane asylum. Meanwhile, his business partner tries to win the case, fails. He ends up dying in the insane asylum. And I have all these sad stories. I'm sorry. <laughs> he ends up dying in an insane asylum. And, and then his reputation, nobody, I mean, everything is public knowledge, but at the same token, because of different things, People think everyone else did it. They attribute it to the ZBG group. They attribute it to Stanley, who didn't do squat. They attribute it to all sorts of other people. And then they sometimes include Gallard and Gibbs. Gibbs was a financial backer who never said I did anything. He's like, I just put the money in and I didn't even have that much. But he went broke trying to defend this case. They never won. And I'm like, but... What I was trying to say was, did this guy do a great invention? Yes. Was he mentally off? Was Unhinged. It? Yes. And did Tesla tell people he was a god who could see in the dark like a bat with tingling in his forehead? Yes. We have a hard time thinking that someone can be have flashes of brilliance 
and flashes of madness, even though we see it, we're like mad scientists. And then they're like, well, everything he said was correct. How dare you? It's a conspiracy. I'm like. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because I, I feel like that madness is often what gives people access to a certain uh, fluidity of ideas. Because you're crazy, you're able to see things that others can't. You're able to pursue ideas when everybody's telling you that you're an idiot. And we've really been very careful about ironing that out of our academic world, of our professional yeah. world. Yeah. Everyone has to be polished. No one can be... Uh, and and it's crazy because I understand why. I'm like, it's probably good that we are getting rid of sexual harassment and are yeah. including more people in the discipline of science and it is growing the the accessibility and the 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 quality of the people that are involved. But at the same point, I'm like, where do the mad geniuses live? Like, are they still doing stuff? Because they certainly exist out there. And are we losing something by not having a space for that kind of unhinged mad genius in the world, male or female? A, it's not even unhinged. We won't accept anyone as a scientist who isn't fabulous at mathematics, mm. isn't fabulous. And I contend that Michael Faraday is the most important scientist who ever lived. And I will defend that to the T. Like, I cannot think of a modern device that I know how it works that doesn't go through Faraday. Nothing. Lepron, X-rays equals MC squared. You name it, it um, ra uh, radio. That's an easy one. Like, it all went through Faraday. And he had a terrible math phobia and went through one week of school before his teacher told his brother to get a switch to hit him and they both bailed. They're like, done, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> we don't need you crap. And he learned from reading books in a book binding shop. I mean, like, we accept more people of different genders and backgrounds and sexualities, but we do not accept different brains. Mm. And we don't accept different brains in physics, like mm. where we need different brains. A hundred percent. It's like, oh, you know, you have ADHD and are totally easily distracted. We can't have you as a professor. It's like, what the hell are you doing? We need diversity of brains in everything, but especially in science. And we have this thing of like, no, only, you know, every scientist has to be great at math. Every scientist has to teach freshman physics. Like, why did we think that? Some of them are terrible. Some of them hate teaching. Why can't we have researchers who don't have to teach? Why you... can't we let researchers teach high school sometimes if that's what they want? Well, why can't we give now. people a little <laughs> bit of flexibility? I was a, a high school teacher for many years, and I ended up going to see the um, Pixar studio. And at the Pixar place, you go in there, and what struck me is, at least at the time, this was before the Disney acquisition, so I can't tell how they do now, how they treated their employees. They said, look, creativity is so important, so we have free lunches. And everyone can come here and eat free lunches together if they want. And we have little scooters and let people scoot. We have all these free classes. You can teach a free class and anyone can go. So they said they had this thing on drawing puppies. And they said it was the most popular class. Everyone went to the drawing puppies class because it's drawing puppies at work. <laughs> and they said because... They never know how creativity is going to come from, where it's going to go to, what odd comment from someone is going to inspire something somewhere else. And I'm like, so we do this to make a great kids movie. And we don't do this to fight climate change. 
Okay, so there's there's a lot there's a lot there, and I think that I understand. I'm sorry. No, 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 I, I just I, I think that I have I, I I think that there's reasons for that that are probably not <sighs> incidental. Like we talk a lot on the show about the relationship of science and power and economics and scientism and the idea that you have the nation leans upon scientific consensus to justify economic action that then feeds back into industrial profits, which then feeds back onto the material basis of civilization. And you have this arc by which the science that is produced is is geared into a much larger machine. And so there's less of an incentive for there to be tons and tons of brains thinking about climate change because you have to have a single conclusion on climate change, which is that it is human-caused and that extinction is coming. But see, I don't think you do. I think what you were saying was like, so, sorry to disagree. I think that there's this idea of like the scientific monolith, and it's totally wrong. Like, let's say you don't believe climate change is a human cause, right? You could still want to know how to desalinate water. You Definitely. could be still be interested in how to deal with storms. But you I could still want to know how plants grow better. You could still want to know how to build seawalls to deal with. You could still want to know how to deal with all of the things that happen in reality. Yeah. And we... Think of science as this, like, like you were saying, like this monolith. But it, it, there, it doesn't matter if there's a scientific con um, consensus about something. You can still do something about something you care about. I think you that what happens is that people, when they write grants, they write. You have to write the grant in a way that is like we're gonna do this so that it stops climate change. And somebody who doesn't believe in that being possible, because like we always talk on the show about, look, every single civilization has fallen because of climate change. Like, there's no civilization that has survived climate change. You can argue about anthropogenic climate change or natural climate change, but literally every single one gets to a point where it's like they had 300 years of drought and they all died. Like. It just, it's. I, I don't know enough about the history of civilizations to agree with you or disagree with you on that one. But I think the problem is one little word you said in there. When you write a grant, yeah. why do we make our researchers beg for money for everything they want to do and say what they're going to discover before they discover it? That's the that's the hitch right there. That that's exactly why where do the we is. set it up where everyone is isolated? Where so let's say you have a grad student and you're like they're going to do Project X, and after a half a year of Project X, they discover something new in Project Y, and they should. What happens? They stick with Project X. They trog through that stupid thing, which means nothing and goes nowhere, and they hate every minute of it. Because Project Y is in a different field. It's in a different subject. You can't work with that professor on project. You know, you're supposed to work on lasers. What do you mean you're working on semiconductors? You can't do it. And we don't give, I mean, it used to be scientists like, the, I was just doing something on uh, Emil Lenz. And Lenz came up with the whole, it's called Lenz's Law. He was very important for early um, electricity. And he started off as a naturalist. He was studying ocean. He went around the world as a teenager with someone whose name I cannot pronounce. <laughs> and he studied plants and water and water flow and all that stuff, right? Then he reads um, George Ohm and Ohm's Law. And he's one of the first people in the world to actually think it doesn't suck. He's like, this is pretty good. Hmm. And then he read Faraday, Law of Induction, which is you move a magnet, you induce current in the water. Or you change the current in one coil, you induce current in the other coil. And he's like, okay, now that's what I'm doing. And he came up with a new law right away. Hmm. But if it was now, he'd go, that's fascinating. I wish I could do something on that. 
-hmm. but it wouldn't matter because if I did, no one would let me be published because I'm an oceanographer, not an electrician. We are, we are saying there's only one kind of scientist. And then even when you are that one kind of scientist, they say you can only discover things in your one field. This ludicrous. It's beca all because we don't look at the history. We don't see how ideas are developed. We say, oh, look at the Manhattan Project. They had everyone <laughs> segregated, so they couldn't talk to each other. And they told you you only could work on one thing. Why they do that? Because they didn't want the Russians to steal it. It wasn't a good way to research, but they're like, it worked. We got a bomb. We should do this from now on. Hmm. It's like, this is so dumb. It's really so painful. Dumb. It's really painful. I mean, we're coming up against this a little bit ourselves. Um, you know, we're, we're, this book that we're writing right now is actually trying to give material representations to quantum mechanical phenomena. So, but it's interesting that we came about it in, in this way. Like I was working in, in like basic elastic mechanics in grad school. Mm -hmm. And I had to teach a, a summer physics course, and I started looking at all these different mathematics of basic light and electricity, and I realized that there was a lot of congruence between elastic mechanics and basic quantum mechanics. And right. I like, started to see the atom as a, as a resonator and so forth, and it's really hard. Like, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't done nothing in that field. I, I published a paper in Nature this summer, like, I, but I go to a physics community of fundamental physicists, and I don't have that credential in, in quantum mechanics, and people just won't talk to me like it's it's very very closed off it's it, it can be quite painful when when you try to bring something to that to a new world it's like right. you know i don't think it's impossible i think it's a in some sense a networking issue like really finding the right collaborator just like i was saying earlier but it's it can be very very painful for people from other disciplines to try to contribute to something outside of their you know domain of expertise let's say i think a big problem is that in order to say something significant about some feature of science, it's important that you understand what is previously known pretty well. 100%. You know, like I will be told all the time, oh, I have a new theory of relativity. I'm like, okay. Um, how is, how is the, how do you deal with the Michelson Morley interference experiment? And they're like, what? Mm. And I said, okay, no, first, if you are going to, I feel like re changing physics is like putting on a Broadway musical. People think what you need to put on a good Broadway musical is a nice score and a good song and a nice plot. And they think if you have all these things that you will be on Broadway, right? But in order to create something profound and good and meaningful, you have to study it, especially theoretical. Experimental, you can sometimes just sort of play with it. Like, what happens here? What happens here? What happens here? Oh, I found something new. Theoretical. You need to know not only you need to study the basics and study the advanced and say how every part of your idea is better than the idea that you had before and means you need to know the idea before. And it becomes frustrating for people who studied the basic one that they don't want to talk to people who have ideas when they don't have the background, but you don't have to go to school to get that background. You don't have to be in a formal setting to get that background because that's not how all the famous scientists got their background. I mean, I, I actually encounter the opposite too, where like I'll talk to people who are, you know, quote unquote experts in some field and they haven't had time to study the history. They actually don't know why they believe the, the worldview that they have. They just have sort of inherited it from their mentors and so forth. And right. that's, that's actually a, a really frustrating end. And, and it's, I'm trying to find a way to do it in a way that doesn't, you know, I don't want to embarrass people or shame them in any way, but it's very difficult when you try to talk to somebody who's, you know, an expert in spin mechanics, but they've never actually looked at how spin was detected in the first place. And they can't actually explain that first experiment to me. It's a, uh, it, it, it can be a really troubling situation. Well, here's my question. Can you explain 
that experiment to them. That's right. That's exactly what I need to be able to do. And, and that's, right. yeah. I mean, to Exa a certain and extent, if yeah. You're, and this is my advice, and feel free to ignore me, is that don't start with that experiment. Go back. Go back as far as you can. You say to yourself, look, I'm going to figure out how they figured out spin. Start with Ampere. I'll give you a good place to start. Ampere learned that Andre Marie Ampere, polymath or polymoth, how do you say it? He was a really smart guy. <laughs> he, did a lot of, he did a lot of smart stuff. Lots of discipline. <laughs> Self taught in everything. He was brilliant in everything. And he heard that a Danish man had figured out if you had current in the wire, it makes a magnetic field around the wire. And he's like, huh, if current can make a magnet, move a magnet, and a magnet can move current, which is what he figured out next, he's like, maybe all magnets are secretly electrical. Maybe all magnets have like loops of current in them. And no, first he said, maybe I can make something that looks like a magnet out of current which is why he ended up spiraling up his wires. And then he's like, oh, it works like a magnet. And then he coiled it up around the piece of glass. He's like, hey, it works like a weak bar magnet. And he says, I think inside the magnet, there is a loop of current. And then his friend Fresnel said, uh, what if I cut in half? It still works. He says, oh, microcurrents, microcurrents. It must be microcurrents. And that led to the idea of spin. Now, I don't know how the spin idea got developed. I haven't studied it. But I, I could see right away from that. Like, okay, that leads to spin. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Absolutely, That's yeah. I think, I think going broken. back as far as you possibly can with these ideas is, is really the best way to, ap to apprehend them and to follow where they're headed and to imagine where they could be headed in the future as well. Exactly. And, and there's a side benefit to it. Because they're written in a way that's understandable. Like you pick up a nature paper today and we're so far down the rabbit hole of mathematization that it's impenetrable unless you are someone who can speak the mathematics. But the math in these early papers is so straightforward that you don't have to have an advanced understanding of, I don't know, differential calculus in order to be able to get it. And that's a, that's a blessing. I think there's something else. We used to publish papers when we, we used to be less scared to publish papers mm. with our opinions, with our ideas. There was a guy in England named Norman Lockyer, and he was working for the English, uh, he was a linguist, and uh, his friend loaned him a telescope. And he's like, this is the best thing ever. I love this. He starts writing little articles for you know, astronomy clubs. He, his friend gives him a really nice lens and he makes a tube out of paper mache. And he's like, this is great. And they just figured out spectroscopy that you could shine light through a prism and split it up into its rainbow and look at the shadows in the rainbow and figure out what the stars are made of. I have a whole video about it. Um, of course. Uh, <laughs> and he was like, he came up with this idea of like how to use that to figure out that the sunspots are not a window to the inside of the sun, but actually thicker atmosphere. And he published in regular, you know, scientific magazine. Hmm. First person, all emotion, exclamation points all over the place. He's like, I saw this and I thought at last, but then I wasn't sure if it was true. So I asked my wife to double check. And she said, yes, it's true. I'm so excited. Exclamation point. I'm like, this is a scientific paper? And he not only figured out the sunspots, he discovered that the chromosphere was a gas. He discovered that the chromosphere was a sphere, named it chromosphere. He discovered helium in the sun. He named helium. <laughs> and he, he had a job as, he then got a job as a, science editor for a magazine, the magazine went put. He convinced his editor to start a new magazine called Nature. That's where nature came from, Norman Lockyer. He ran mm. it for 50 years and 
he let people argue and debate. And so there used to be, magazines used to be places where people would write for the general public. And they would put out their ideas that they were a little less sure of. They're like, I'm thinking of this, but I don't know about this. I think you're an idiot. <laughs> Let me say the 20 reasons why you're full of it. Like, it but it's so fascinating the- because that's not the case anymore, even for the magazines. Like, we can set aside yeah. the scientific journals. Fine. Nature and science have gotten to the point where they're difficult to parse. Cell has, I don't know if you've ever looked at a cell paper, but it's like figures 1 through 20, panels A through H in every single one. So it's just this incredibly detailed work. But you go to Scientific American, you go to Discover, you go to Popular Mechanics, and you pitch them ideas, because that's what we were doing for a while, of just trying to write pop science stuff about theories that hadn't been published yet. Mm -hmm. And they're like, is there a peer-reviewed publication? Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, why? The, the whole point is that there's the theories out there that haven't passed that, that threshold yet, and we should be talking about them and debating them, but editors, want they don't want to touch that. Yeah, there, I think there's a distinction, though, because there should be a peer-reviewed paper, but it doesn't have to be written in the last hundred years. In fact, it's better if it wasn't. If you're saying... I have a new idea. It's got to be based on science fact. Sure, yeah. But it doesn't have to be a rehash of someone else's damn idea. Like, people all the time, they're like, oh, well, I found this because it's true because it's in a peer-reviewed paper from 2005. I'm like, people publish garbage in peer-reviewed paper all the time. All it means is the peers decided it wasn't completely full of it. It's not like, now this is law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or it didn't completely undermine what they were working on. It, it, it's Science is supposed to have debate. It's not supposed to be this is truth and this is false. It's supposed to be this is a good model. We like it. We think it's robust. We think it can hold up to scrutiny. And then someone else says, how about this? Does it work here? How about there? I think this model is better. And then people fight about it so much. And then eventually a bunch of people decide that that model is good. And then maybe 30 years later, they go, you know what? That model's crap. It doesn't have to. But in order to be a new theory, it has to be based on science, the science that came before it. But that's that's insufficient for an editor oh, yeah. to take. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've fallen down. We've forgotten what science is and what science should be. I think that's exactly We've, it, because the idea is that science is exclusively that which is peer-reviewed yeah. rather than a complete piece of, you know, reason that follows from one observation to another observation that leads you to the overwhelming question that you right. then ask an answer. And that that playfulness is what's missing. And I think that our project is really trying to find a place for that again, because we want to bring people together that are at that place and are still going through that Dunning-Kruger moment where they're, they're trying to figure out the ideas. They're trying to put them on the table and to digest them in situ. I was going to mention that. The Dunning-Kruger, I'm trying to say it right, is, I think... A hundred percent misunderstood. For example, have you ever read it? The paper. I've not. not. I never read it either. I just like, oh, stupid people are stupid. They're too stupid to know they're stupid. Oh, what a shame. It's so frustrating. Stupid people are so frustrating. (laughs) So I was watching this video (laughs) by this guy named, um, I'm looking it up, Mark Manson. And the title of it was Why Stupid People Think They're Smart. Now, usually I wouldn't pick on a video like that because I hate things being called stupid. I think it's ludicrous. I think there's so many ways to be smart, and I don't know what it means to be stupid. Literally, I don't. Like, if you don't know how something works, does that make you stupid or uneducated? Like, I don't know how to speak Swahili. Am I stupid? I guess only if you're advocating that you do, but you don't, or something like (laughs) that. I guess the only stupid thing is if you're saying I'm, but so anyway, so I was watching this video and he's 
giving me descriptions of what this means in more detail. And he, his example was, imagine you're learning to play basketball. You start off and you manage to make a few hoops. And you're like, shoot, I know a lot about basketball. I'm pretty good. And then you learn more and you realize, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. You're not that good. You don't know squat, right? And I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it. And it kind of hurt my feelings because I've had periods where I knew less. I was just learning. And I jumped to conclusions. And I didn't feel like I was stupid. And so it sort of hurt my feelings. was kind of sit there. And it took me months before I went, wait a minute. That's not stupid. The kid playing basketball. He's not stupid. He's learning, right? He's, and what the original paper is called, unskilled and unaware of it. He's not stupid. He's unskilled. Mm. Everyone's unskilled. Everyone learns something new. And as a former high school teacher, my biggest problem, my biggest problem was fear of a fear of physics. My students were so terrified of being wrong that they literally could not think. They would, I would used to do this thing. I'd do everything I could to make them feel better, to feel calm, so that they could learn something. And I would do this thing the first week. I'd have a quiz at the end of the week, which was, what are the rules of the class? And it was open notes. So, like, you could look at what you wrote down. You could look at my syllabus. There was... No way to fail this thing, except if you cheated. And one of the questions was, why is it bad to cheat? Name three reasons. And I accepted anything. I accepted you bad. I accepted it naughty. I, anything. I did not reject anything except for it's great to cheat. That's it. Or cheating. But people cheated on the why shouldn't you cheat on your quiz question. Come on. <laughs> Because, and it used to frustrate me so much. And then I realized what it was, but only too late, which was they were so petrified of getting it wrong. They were so insecure that they couldn't learn anything. Hmm. And I have the same thing with um, riding a bike. I learned to barely ride a bike when I was a kid, and then I never did it. And my husband's been trying to get me to get on a bike at like the park in a flat area with an electric bike. And I literally freak out and start crying and having panic because I, I have dyspraxia, both physically and verbally, which means that I'm klutzy as hell. Mm. I have very poor muscle memory. Most people, you throw a basket five times. You're like, oh, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. I throw it five times. I might get it in the hoop by the end. The next day, I'm just as bad as I was yesterday. <laughs> and so I am so scared that I can't, I could ride a bike. I'm not that klutzy anymore. But I'm too scared to learn how to ride a bike. And so I think that this, I looked at the Dunning-Kruger um, paper. It's like three pages long. You like it. It's three pages long, very little math. It's really easy to read. And they said, we got 50 Cornell students and we asked them how they thought they'd do on a quiz. And then we gave them the quiz. And then we compared the results. And I'm like, first, that's not stupid people. You already pre-selected people who are good tests. People who are knowledgeable, people who are self-confident, right? Mm. And then I looked at the actual numbers. The people who went, the unskilled people who got the lowest 25%, they're in the lowest 25 percentile. They said, how are you going to do on the test? They said, I think I'm going to do badly. I think I'm going to do 62% right on this test. Then they took the test. They got 12% right. This is not a problem. This is a good thing. You want people who are just beginning to go, I'm not good, but I can still learn it. Otherwise, they're like my student who couldn't tell me if the second was a time or a distance or a speed. If you've ever learned anything, 
you always go with, I'm just started sewing. I'm going to make a dress. And then you go, oh, okay. Well, that took me a little longer. <laughs> but when you make your first dress, you're like, I'm great. I am almost at a professional level. I am a fashionista. <laughs> and they call that the wall of stupid or the mouth stupid. I'm like, no, that's the wall of basic competence. And enthusiasm too, right? Because I think yeah. it feeds back on this idea of potential for what you will learn and what you will become now that you have just tasted it for the first time. Right. It's it's vital for learning. And the conclusion seems to be, oh, it's dangerous. We got to tell people they're dumb. I'm like, people know they're dumb. They think they're dumber than they are. It's just no one's used to a test where the where a 12% is possible. Frankly, <laughs> yeah, that's true. No one would guess that the twelve percent is possible. You'd have to give them a question like, "Hey, I'm going to give you a test on grammar." That was one of the tests. I'm going to give you a test on grammar, and every single problem is going to be really advanced. How do you think you're going to do? They go, "Oh, shoot, maybe five, ten percent right." You say, "I'm going to give you a test on grammar." They're like, "Oh, I'm bad at grammar. I think I'm going to get sixty percent." <laughs> That seems completely reasonable and well, not dangerous at all. The framing of these things matters, right? So if you if you ask somebody if you'll do a procedure with a ten percent survival rate or yeah. a ninety percent or sorry uh, a ninety percent survival rate or a ten percent death rate, you get very different responses mm -hmm. to the likelihood that whether or not people want the procedure. And so we know that the way that you frame these things changes the context in which people see themselves quite, but, quite obviously. But the other thing, the part of the study, I mean, they made the study. If you read it, it's all about the dangers of the unskilled. Oh no, they think too highly of themselves. Oh no, they'll make bad decisions. Of course they'll make bad decisions. You're just learning. It doesn't matter how skilled or unskilled you think. I mean, how talented or untalented you think you are. If you're just learning to sew, You'll make a lot of bad decisions. Mm. I'm just thinking that analogy because I don't know how to sew and my daughter got my daughter a sewing machine and she has quite high um, opinions of what's going to happen. I don't know, but I, I can't help her. But like, it, it's not a danger for people to start off and think they're going to do well. It's a blessing. It's a mm. good thing. The danger is the other end. The smart people who, so the top end people, the people who got uh, the one test, I think it was a logic test. They gave the, the top 25% got an average of 86%. Guess what percent they thought they would get right? 100. Do you want to make a guess? Yeah, 100? The, 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 no, I heard 100. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I would assume they thought they would do and they would ace it somehow. They thought they would get 68% right. Really? Interesting. Yes. Okay. And this goes on and on. In fact, for logic, their percentage that they thought was lower than for um, grammar, where their thought was a little higher. And humor, uh, uh, why, what, humor? <sighs> I, I honestly think the whole study started because someone had a spouse who was like, I have a great sense of humor. And when some one of them said, oh, honey, you don't know enough about humor to know that you don't have a great sense of humor. <laughs> I really think this is what happened. Because who does a study on whether you're skilled in understanding humor when humor is so damn subjective and so damn cultural? What they did is they studied, they interviewed like a bunch of American comedians and they had them rank what was funny. They were the decider of what was funny. And then they asked people how they would do on a humor test. And I'm sure most of it was cultural. Like, oh, I'm not from this country. Uh, I probably wouldn't do well with American humor. I'm probably at 65%. <laughs> oh, no, you're at 15%. Like, it's infuriating. Mm -hmm. But it, so what I'm saying is everyone has taken this test as, oh, no, because it was framed that way. They're unskilled. That's the problem. The unskilled people don't know that they don't know enough. 
and they fall for BS. I'm like, they fall for BS because the skilled people don't believe in themselves. Hmm. The skilled people aren't willing to say, hey, this is BS. The skilled people aren't willing to make mistakes. The skilled people aren't willing to let the show that it's hard for us to figure out the answer, even if you studied it for decades. That real ideas, real knowledge takes time. And sometimes you can come to the cleverest, cleanest, most beautiful idea, and it took you 20 years to come in. And you're like, damn, I'm an idiot. I have to hide that and just say, I came up with this. The answer is this. It's like, no, it took you a long time. It's not obvious. If physics was obvious, it would be philosophy. We would have had it in the ancient Greek time. It's not obvious. It is not. You have to think about it. And I cannot tell you how many times with history and with physics where I like, see something, I read it, I, I acknowledge it. And then weeks, days, months, years later, I'm lying in bed and I go, oh, wait. Oh, wait. It's not like this. I mean, it was just sitting there. It was still there before. But they suddenly go, oh, my goodness, that's what this means. And when we don't acknowledge that, we expect our experts to be perfect. And when mm. they aren't perfect, we reject them and go for people who we say are perfect. Mm. And that's why we go for pseudoscience. It's because we expect perfection from our scientists. And when they disappoint us, we reject everything. And instead of saying, look, science comes from people. I like to say science is personal because scientists are people. <laughs> and when we remove the personhood from it, when we remove the real story, when we remove, when we stop teaching the science through the history, when we remove scientists' personality and try to make us automatons, so never use I, never use an exclamation point, never say you were confused in a paper, never make, say, hey, I wonder if this would be useful for this. No, 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 no. You only publish it when you're 100% sure. I look in the past. They're like, um, uh, the guy who discovered uranium made, ura uh, made radiation. He published it two days after he discovered it. He's like, I found this amazing thing. And that, no, first he said uranium, fluorescent uranium, when he put it in the sunlight, it would go through a piece of paper and make the film develop like x ray. And then, then it was cloudy. And he's like, ah, oh, I can't do it. I'll just do a baseline and it won't work. And it did. It worked just as well if it was in the sunshine or not. He published that one the next day. Pu How did he publish it? Like letter to the Royal Society? or yep. he was French. So the Royal Society of France. He was a scientist in studying, um, what do you call it? Um, fluorescence and phosphorescence. Mm. The difference is one needs direct sunlight, one can wait a little bit. Um, and I can never remember which is which. And, uh, but, but he was just like, I thought this would be a cool idea. I tried it. Look at it. Isn't it amazing? But that's There's a lot of incentive structures against doing that today, too. Like, I, I, mm. I had this really personal experience with this because I made the dis discovery that led to my whole PhD and, and all my publication history in that field very early on. And I remember walking at like four in the morning back from the lab with my advisor. And he, and he was like, well, we could just write this up and send it off right now. Or we could invest a lot in it and just do tons of research alongside it and then probably get it into some big magazine like Nature or Science. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like, what do you want to do? But it, it, it made a lot of sense, you know, since I was just starting my PhD to, to go ahead and work on it for a long time. And it took us 10 years after that, that moment right. to actually wrap it into something. But I don't know if that was the right thing to do either at the same time, which is I interesting. I, I think we've, we've set up the structure where we're trying to be perfect 
And that is so anti-scientific. Science should be messy. Science should be argumentative. Science should be fact-based, but not perfect. If you try to be perfect, you're not going to discover. It's really hard to discover anything new. And it takes so long. If you had published it raw, you're like, here, I have this idea. I think it's really great. I want to develop it further. Imagine the responses you could have got that might have changed how you developed it over those 10 years. I think the fear was that it would end up in a, it would get less eyes on it, right? It would just end up in some minor journal that maybe 300 people would read. And uh, that's the incentive structure that I'm trying to point out is that because we sat on it for 10 years, now thousands of people have read it, right? And cited it and so forth. And, And so it's actually getting attention that way. But the fear was that it would just get buried in the mud otherwise. See, I, I feel like we don't realize that, like, the paper you've done 10 years before is different than the paper you did 10 years later. Mm. We can share. There's this whole idea of, like, oh, my gosh, you have an original idea. Keep it secret. Mm-hmm. Keep it safe. What if someone takes it? It's mm-hmm. like no one else understands your idea the way you do. Yeah, no exactly. one else understands it. You don't have to be worried about people stealing your idea. If it's a real idea, only you know it in the way. I mean, you could ex- you could sp- I could spend an I think hour the, explaining I think my the real fear. Yeah, huh? I think the I think the real fear is not that they're going to steal your idea, but that they're going to develop into something more powerful than you would be able to develop it into. Right? Well, That's what I think. Isn't that good? It, I mean, not if you're just concerned with your own preeminence in this in the world and you want to have your name in lights not if that's what i'm talking about i don't don't even think hold on hold on i think that that's a very craven way of looking at it i think that the more reasonable way of looking at it is that there is a market at play there's a limited number of positions there's a limited number of places where you can go to get a job that will allow you to support your family and people recognize that their publication record, their track record, their reputation is what gives them the competitive edge in the market. And so some people certainly are like, I want to win the Nobel Prize. We had a guy recently who who didn't want to talk about some stuff on the podcast because he's thinking about the Nobel Prize and he knows that if he says it, then somebody hears it and they work on it, then maybe and it's right, I don't I don't support it. I don't agree, but I do think that there's a secondary level to it, which is that for the vast majority of people I think that they're just worried with getting the credit because they need it for for their job. I think they need it to just be secure in the world to right. know that their position is okay and they have enough money. What I was going to say is that, like, I'm not doubting that his work could win a Nobel Prize because sure. it's possible. What I'm doubting is, is that if he puts it out there and someone else develops it more, that he won't win the Nobel Do you see what I mean? Like, exciting ideas that create more idea is more important than just having an idea. It doesn't matter as much what you do. You're just one person. What you inspire is what's important. Okay, so this comes back to the question of citation and of networking. Because if you come up with an idea and everybody's Mm -hmm. like, you're a dick and I'm not going to cite you, then it actually is possible that you put your idea out, nobody likes you, and they just take your idea and they run with it and they find ways of getting around citing you because they cite the next guy who works on it, who's better networked than you. Well, yes, but I think it's more that I think that we get, I think it goes back to the Dunning-Kruger effect. We are so nervous that we only have this little bit to get. Yeah. That we hoard it mm. in case someone takes any little part of it. But we have so much more to give. We have so much more knowledge than we think. It, the more we give out freely, the more people make it grow, the better it is. If we went into science and understanding to improve our connection to reality, to make us understand the world better, then it's like the thing about like, if you try to skimp on money, you end up You know, like uh, you try to be more frugal, you end up losing out on everything. Like some with thoughts, with ideas, you need to share it or it won't grow. 
And I think that comes from the fact that we've been so conditioned to be fearful. The more knowledgeable we are, the more fearful we are that we don't really know what we're getting. The people who are getting, you know, those the 85% versus, but I wonder if, I mean, if you look at the test in this paper between, I mean, they only had three tests, between the grammar and the logic, that you can see that the people taking the logic test at the top end were more insecure than the people in the grammar. <laughs> and the way to make them feel less insecure was have them look at other tests from other students. Because once they realized that they were judging themselves against their small peers who all were smart, instead of the vast majority of people, they realized that they were experts in them. They could do things and that they didn't need to falsely believe that they were D-plus students when they were B-plus students. And I bet you when the number get to be like 99%, I bet you all the time, it's just so much lower, especially in physics, because we're so beaten up by how complicated, how confusing it is, and how long it takes us to come to simple conclusions. And we don't realize all the greats took forever, took forever, made so many mistakes. Made so, I mean, I found a math error in Maxwell's 1862 paper on Maxwell's equations. He just had a square root of two, four pi that shouldn't have been there. He fixed it in the next paper. But like, it's just like, ah, yeah, he was human. He was human. He did a lot of confusing things, a lot of confusing things. I mean, if you read Oliver Heaviside, who was a, a, um, nepotism baby working in, um, telegraphs and he, his uncle owned the business and he worked for it and he read Maxwell's book. He's like, this is amazing. I quit my job moving to my parents' attic. All I'm going to do all day is figure this out. And then he wrote papers in a trade magazine all the time for five years until the trade magazine got a new owner and said, stop doing it. <laughs> no one reads you. And then luckily a guy named Hertz discovered radio waves and said, Hey, I, I heard this guy named all of, and then people are like, let's read Maxwell. And then they're like, oh no, let's not. This is impossible. Let's read all of her episodes. <laughs> yeah, because most people proof. see those four equations and they think that that, that that was Maxwell's contribution, but it was actually heavy sides who cleaned it up for him. Nope. All right. I figured out it wasn't. Okay. I, that, that's it how was I understood it. Actually, Lorentz, uh, Hendrik, Oliver Heaviside came up with two equations. He called mm. them duplex equation. The problem is that um, Maxwell had this equation for the electric field, and it had a V cross V in it. It had a magnetic field component to it. And he didn't know what to do with that. And then Oliver Heaviside's like, let's get rid of it, and then let's put it back in. <laughs> hmm. And he's like, let's get rid of it in the electric field and put it back in into this other equation just to make it a little easier to look at. And uh, Hendrik Lorenz, I'm pretty sure I'm butchering both parts of his name. Hendrik? I don't know. Hendrik Lorenz. Um, he was like, um, so part of it, part of the reason that everyone wanted the ether is because of another mistake by Maxwell. Faraday said, I think light is a vibration of electric or magnetic waves. And at the end of it, he, because... I want to keep the vibrations, but drop the ether. And Maxwell wrote his equation to make it, to put Faraday's ideas, Faraday hated math, like had zero math, zero equations in all his books. And they're impossible for me to read because I need a few equations. I look at old papers. I go to the equations. I don't read the whole thing. It's too hard, too much. And I'm confused by their language. I go to their equation and I say, how did you derive the equation? Faraday, I can't do it. He's a pain to read for me. And I, he's my favorite person. I, I, I love him, but he's not perfect. He, I just love him because he was so poetic. He said that um, scientists should not be ants who merely gather, 
nor spiders who merely spin from their bowels, but bees who both gather and produce. Hmm. Poetic guy, and all with no education, but uh, um, what was I saying? God, that, well, I oh, Lawrence. Do, I yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I do want to I want to dig into uh, the death of the ether a little bit more. Big news, everyone. We have officially announced ticket sales for Demysticon 2024. This is our first scientific conference. And what we're going to be doing is we are bringing together our favorite podcast guests in Austin, Texas, April 7th and 8th of 2024. And we're going to have a slew of incredible speakers. For right now, we don't have everyone confirmed. But of the ones that we do have confirmed, we have our favorite scientist, Pierre-Marie Robitaille. We have ancient mythology scholar John F. White of the Craig and Ford YouTube channel. We have Ogi Ogas, consciousness researcher. We have Steve Keen, economist. And we have many more that are on deck that we will announce very, very soon. So check out the link in the description. And we hope to see you in Austin, Texas of 2024. I mean, we really want to understand the transition that occurred where physics went from mechanical to non-mechanical and, and purely mathematical almost at this point. I I I don't think it did. I think like in Newton's paper, book was ridiculously mathematical. In fact, he purposefully made it extra mathematical, and he didn't want the plebs to be able to read it. He was not a pleasant guy. But Newton did this thing where he said he made this little caveat where he said, you know, I've described how these systems operate, you know, quantitatively, but I don't feign any hypotheses about the cause of these phenomena. And mm. that, that seems to have been lost in the modern dialogue because we have all these elaborate mathematical descriptions of the way things unfold, but people are pointing to those as if they are explanations, as if they are mechanistic explanations. But, right. but Newton didn't do that. He understood they weren't mechanistic explanations. He understood that they were quantitative descriptions of the systems. And so right. hold on. let's see if we, I want to, I want to see if I can lay this out in a way that's historical, that, that captures, yes. that, that hooks you. So Newton lays out he invents a new mathematics for being able to talk about the motion of bodies. And so you have dynamic, you have calculus that allows you to talk about rates of change in a way he that co algebra... Co-invented it. Co-invented it, right, with uh, Leibniz. Yes, no, yeah, you're totally right. You're totally right. I haven't studied Newton, so that's, I have to put that out there. That's totally fine. This is this is a longer story than Newton. So, so bas and then Newton, he uh, writes his Principia, deeply mathematical. He lays out tons of these mathematical relationships but yet people are still trying to understand the the thing that is beneath the mathematics there is this approach where we have the mathematical equation the mathematical equation tells us about the behavior of a system now we must go and we understand the system and so if you look at something like the ideal gas law you have to conceptualize that there are these molecules and the molecules are bumping around against each other and they're 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 doing stuff and because they're doing stuff this is the way that the mathematical equation relates to their behavior and so you have both the mathematics and you have a conceptual understanding of the way that the bodies are behaving. And then... Okay. Oh, no, no, go ahead. See, to me, you've already lost me. Okay. Because what I, what I love is physics. Physics is magical. I, 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 when I was a little girl, there's a museum around here called the Exploratorium, San Francisco Bay Area. I love the Exploratorium. Oh, my God. I grew and, up in that place. We went on, like, one of our first dates there. So. Oh, my God. It's amazing, isn't it? And they have these little stations, right? And at the little stations, it's like to do and notice. So you like put this in here and do it. And something unusual happens. And then you turn the page and it says, this is why we think it happened this way. And I felt like I was watching a magician reveal all their tricks. And instead of thinking less of the magician, I felt more. Oh my gosh, you hit the coin in here and you moved it over here and that's how you did it and that's how it works and you could use it for something else. I wanted to be a magician when I grew up and I wanted to share the joy of magicianship with others. Not necessarily the, I mean, almost every physicist I know is like, oh, I loved it because of black holes. I'm interested in dark matter. I'm like, I'm bored by dark matter. I don't care. I don't really like it. Doesn't make much sense to me, but I'm not interested enough to study it. And that's okay. People think that's not okay. This is 
you know, cons everyone in physics agrees on this. I'm like, I didn't agree, but I don't have an effort to disagree. And that's okay. I don't have to have an, I don't have to agree with what other people do, but if I haven't studied it, I'm not allowed to disagree. I'm sure. just allowed to say, it doesn't make me happy, but I'm not interested enough to look into it. Yes. If that makes any sense. Because sure. otherwise, I'm pontificating about something that I haven't studied enough, or I'm agreeing to something that I don't agree with. And it doesn't make it wrong. I'm not saying, oh, dark matter isn't real. I'm just saying, I don't agree with it yet, because I've never read anything that made it make sense. But at the same token, I'm not interested enough yet. And maybe something will come up and I'll go, ooh, this is so cool. I want to know more. And then I'll dig into it. And then I'll probably think it's amazing and tell everyone about it. <laughs> Pour the tears out of everyone. But so for me, you started good. You started with Newton, except there was no law. And then you switched straight to um, Boyle's law. And you didn't even get to Dalton, the guy who came up with the idea that molecules, that everything was made of molecules and everyone was like making fun of him. By the way, he was a tutor for James Jewell, who was a kid working at his grandfather's beer brewery. And James Jewell discovered, tried to make a motor that was good. And he was really frustrated it wouldn't work. So he's like, OK, I need to measure things better. And then he figured out how to measure the current better. And then he figured out the power of a thing of wire by how much it heated water over time is I squared times R. And he's like, huh, well, if he, maybe heat is a form of energy, work, heat, energy, they're all part of the same thing. And so he did that partially because he was tutored by Dalton, the guy who said everything's full of atoms and they're all moving around, even if it looks solid. So for me, and, and he was, like I said, he was just a beer brewer and a kid. And he started publishing in every magazine he can find until people start going. And he gave this talk one time, and there was a scientist in the audience. And he was like, he was going to stand up and say, this is ludicrous. But instead, he stopped and listened. And he said, there's something in here that's true. And afterwards, they talked. They became great friends. And the scientist, William Thompson, wrote this paper in 1849 that was like temperature, it was the coldest temperature you can get is negative 273 Celsius. And he used the heat is indestructible. He did not use Joule's idea. We did not use modern idea. But he put a little footnote. Mr. James Joule of Manchester has some interesting experiments that say otherwise. And that started the ball rolling. And now we measure energy in joules. And William Thompson became ennobled Lord Kelvin. And we measure the temperature after him. But ideas can come from anywhere. But see, to me, when you follow how the idea progressed, it's so meaningful. But when you jump from one idea, to one physics thing to another, that's philosophy. And that's fine. I'm not opposed to philosophy, but I don't have squat to say. I mean, I have squat to say in terms of like, you talk about the scientists and I divert you right back to science. I, th no, I, think I think you were trying to give an overview, but maybe you didn't finish. Yeah, I was trying to oh, give I'm an sorry. overview. No, no, it's totally fine. I think I, I think that I have a tendency to look at these things in more 30,000 foot views. And so I wasn't trying to say that there was a direct line between the ideal gas law and Newton and nothing in between them. I was I was using them as these sorts of like peaks in right. between where where there's the 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 fabric of history lies in between them. The 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 point that I'm trying to make is that if you look at the way that we describe the world right now and you go to the particle physicists and you go to the quantum mechanicists and what you get is you get quantum field theory that everything is made out of fields and when you ask what a field is, a field is a set of vectors that change over time and then no one is looking to see what causes the vector measurement. What causes the measurement? Why, why do these things change? Why are they the way that they are? That question of why is a question that appears to have been left behind when 
we abandoned the luminiferous ether because we had a substance that was the substance that was the why of light. It was the substance that created light. And I disagree. You, you, okay, please, please, please. Okay, well, the first thing is that um, fields were invented by Michael Faraday. Um, yes. Magnetic fields in 1831, electric fields far more exciting in 1837 when he did my favorite activity, which is he decided to look at science history because he said it was much more important with new knowledge to go back to the past with new eyes and see it for yourself. So he read that Charles Augustine Coulomb had found the charges were on the surface of conductors. And Faraday's like, this is fascinating. I need a closer look, like a lot closer. So he built a giant cage and went inside it and lived in it, is what he said. But he went inside the giant metal cage. And while there are all these sparks on the outside, he was protected on the inside. And he's like, ah, I have this vision of every charge emanating these electric lines of force and the positive charge emanating positive lines and the negative charges are absorbing these lines. And they're all moving around. And the traditional scientists hated it. Oh, my gosh. There were all these letters to the editor. Dear Mr. Faraday, we know you love, we love you. We know we thank you with all sorts of respect, but please rethink this. This is the worst idea you've ever had, basically. I mean, they were much more polite than that because he was the most famous scientist in the world and the darling. So they were like, trust me, I'm not doing this out of hatred. I just think you've lost your way. And um, so it's, it's fascinating. So the idea of field is nothing to do with the idea of ether. And the problem is, if you start with the death of ether instead of the birth of ether. Okay. And... I don't think you were out saying that fields came from the ether, were you? No, not necessarily. But I want to... I, do, do you want to try... Do you want to Do you want to take a shot at the arc? Well, I, I think that I've, I've laid it out sufficiently and just that I think it's quite apparent that the predominant view at the moment is that physical reality is fundamentally mathematical there there is no real like look physics started out as being about bodies either pushing or pulling on one another in order to produce phenomena and that seems to no longer be the case in so much as a particle is not actually a body that has you know a surface bound volume that's actually it has architecture and so forth. These are just point particles, right? These are instantiations of a field. And a field is really just a set of predictable actions, right? Fields are dynamic. They're not static like a table, right? They, they have momentum and they have, the, they have a dynamic quality. There's a time domain to fields baked into the cake. And so there's no real mediation of these phenomena at the fundamental level. The question is, when when did that happen, and why did it happen, and why were people so r willing to take on that somewhat unscientific proposition that you didn't need mediators in order to produce phenomenon? The uh, I would see the problem with this in my mind is you're trying to take a global view of something. And it, it's hard to argue for or against it without knowing the details of how it developed. You're saying, okay, it's like you're starting with the conclusion. Well, I'm just looking you know around I mean? the room. Like, I'm just looking at the way that things are taught and discussed. And I'm trying to understand how we got here because I, I right. yeah. So if you want to know how you got there, it's like you said about the spin. You want to know how the spin works and why, if it's BS or not, because it really might be. I've never studied it. It's the same feeling I have about dark matter. I'm like, it seems a little weird. <laughs> Study where it came from. Study where it came from, and you will see why it was accepted and why it was rejected. And because it would be both. I can get the surface level view of that. I think we've done a good job of understanding the scientific climate in terms of them being un unable to detect the, the mediator, right? All of these inferometer experiments that were unable to robustly detect the ether. There was also the development of relativity, which essentially said, hey, we don't need to worry about it. Like, I can understand that, but I can't understand the climate of a people that are willing to accept that as a solution. 
where they're willing to say, okay, we couldn't detect the ether, so let's just not worry about it anymore. That's oh. really interesting to me. Okay, so I, I did want to talk about like where the ether came from and why it was a big thing for a while and then why it stopped being a big thing mm -hmm. for a while and then why it came to be a big thing but not with scientists so much. Mm. Um, because there is, that's the story, actually. Yes. It's not just, it was really important and then we rejected it for no reason. There was a reason it was resurrected. It's an ancient idea. Sure. The ancient Greeks, and I think it was Aristotle, but don't quote me, had this idea that there were five elements. And they're all, depending on how much they were attracted to the earth. Rock is the bottom, water, gas, fire, because like if you put a rock in water, it will sink. You put a bubble in water, it will rise. You have fire in the fire pit, it will rise up even further. And the ether of the heaven. It's all layered. And it's all logical. And it all makes sense. You drop a rock, it falls down. You have a bubble, it goes up. It was very satisfying. If things want to stop. You roll a ball, it eventually stops. It was super, we forget that physics is by its very nature counterintuitive. If it was intuitive, it would be philosophy. This is philosophy. Because they didn't test it. They're just like, look, this goes like this. This is logical. Here we go. And then, start. I mean, people attribute things. I attribute things to a guy named William Gilbert, who was working for Queen Elizabeth as her doctor, but wasn't very busy and because she didn't like doctors because she wasn't an idiot. And so he, like, like most Renaissance men, wanted to study other things. He started studying magnets, possibly because he heard that in the southern hemisphere, a compass still pointed north, even though there was no north star. And he's like, huh, wonder if the Earth is a magnet, not the north star. So he got a natural magnet grinds it down into a sphere and he hangs it up by a hook and he finds that it spins around its axis every day. And he's like, huh, not only is the earth a magnet, but the earth is definitely spinning, which is kind of a dangerous thing to say in the like 1690, no wait, 1590, 1590, long time ago. Um, and, but also he started doing something that he said was unheard of which was he started doing experiments. He's like, huh, I wonder what the rules for magnets are. Let's call one end North Pole. Let's call the other end the South Pole. What are the rules? How does it work? Let's figure it out. Let's see what we see. And he also start, studied electric forces because he's like, is it the same thing? Let's check it out. Let's look at this. So in my mind, he is the kind of the origin, him and Galileo are kind of, and who he influenced, are very much the, and, you know, there's other people in there. I'm not much into the philosophy. I really don't care. I'm sorry. Sorry, not meaning to yuck or yum. Um, of, like, the whole idea of, look, let's just not state things. Let's actually look and see if it's true. Mm -hmm. And some of the things he discovered, we figured out are wrong. Like he thought electric forces only attract. He didn't know they repel. He didn't know there are two kinds of electric forces. There's a bunch of stuff he didn't know because he was just starting. But what that did is it inspired other people to pick at it. Like, I don't know if you're right. I don't know if that's true. How about this case? What about this? What about this other thing? Let's put this together. I think you're wrong here. I think you're right here. Let me try this experiment. Let me do this thing. I have this new theory of how it works based on the old one. And each person built on the last and tore down the last and disagreed with the last and used it in another context and discovered something new with it and then had a whole new theory of it. And by this time, people weren't that interested in the whole rock, water, gas, fire, whatever. And Newton came around. This part I do know about. Newton was obsessed with light. He actually took a big stick and he was like, I wonder how my eye works. I will put my big stick in my eye. 
move it around, see what happens. <laughs> Turns out, hurts. <laughs> but also, he was okay. It damaged him for a little bit, and then it was fine. Because he's walking hurt. Don't put sticks in your eyes, please, please, please. But, um, <clears throat> but one of the things he said was, there was this piece of glass called Icelandic spa. It was a, the ancient um, Vikings used to use it to help them travel. And it looks different if you look at reflected light, if one way versus the other. And it, what it does is it splits up the polarization of the light in there. But if you look at reflected light, it only has one polarization. So it looks slightly different. And you can use it to tell where the sun is if it's cloudy. Because you still have light reflecting off the water, even if it's cloudy. So that's how the ancient Vikings used And Newton said, well, shoot, if it's slightly different this way, then the he imagined light is like a rock skipping off the water. It only skipped if it's flat. It doesn't skip if it's doinking in there. Mm -hmm. And that's called the polarization of light. And because he thought of it as a rock, he's like, light is, comes in little packets. It comes in little light packets, like little rocks. Corpuscles. Huh? Corp, Corp yes. Yeah. How's that how you say that? Corpuscle. Corp Corp I think. Corpuscle? That's how I always say it. Corpuscle? Corpuscle? Corpuscle, but it's the corpuscular model. Yeah. Corpuscular model. That just is revolting. <laughs> little blobs. <laughs> So anyway, of course, Newton says it. Everyone's like, that's right. There's actually this woman named Emily de Chatelet in France. Oh, yeah. And uh, she... Voltaire's girlfriend. Huh? This Voltaire, is Voltaire's right. girl girlfriend, yeah. She was in an arranged marriage with a very nice man whom she really liked, but didn't like that way. She had a couple of kids with him. And they had a very open marriage. And she writes her friend. She's like, Voltaire, my husband and I are going to hole up in my house for months and work on this book. I don't know if I'm crazy or not. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're probably crazy. That's a little intense. I mean, one thing, open marriage. That's another open marriage. But anyway, they write, she helps them write a book on Newton, translate, and then they do this thing on light and she thinks he's full of it. And so she does it in secret. And afterwards he breaks up with her. <laughs> pissed him mm. off. Oh, I always wondered. Fun. I wondered what went because I knew that their relationship soured at some point, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah, she published without him, and on the secret thing, and everyone's like, "Ooh, look at her doing it behind his back," and hers is better. Neither one won the prize, but hers was on how well if light has mass, then we get bombarded with light. That and it's going really, really, really fast. And I think Leibniz is right. The time to stop it, the depth to stop it is the depends on the mass times velocity squared, not the mass times velocity, like Newton thought. I'm like, he's she's like, dang, that's a lot of force. It can't have a mass. It can't have a mass. And her works were quoted by her friend who started the first encyclopedia. So they're very influential. And there was this guy in England who I know read her because he gave a talk where he came up with the word energy and he referred to her directly. So I know he read her. And Young was like, I wonder if light is a particle or sound. He's like, or light is a particle or wave. He's like, huh, well, how do I test that? He said, well, I can just study waves. So he literally built a little like pond. He starts splashing around. He's like, what do waves do? Let me study waves and see if light will mimic them or not. He starts splashing around, splashing around. And he realizes that if he splashes in two spots, he makes this interference pattern. Bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. He's like, think, 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 bright, dark, bright, dark. Okay, that's it. I'll shine my light through two little holes which they change to two little slits so you can see it. And if the other side has two little holes, two little dots, it's a particle. If it has bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, it's a wave. So he does it. And not only does it make the bright, dark, bright, dark, but the different colors separate. He's like, it's not only a wave, but the different colors have different frequencies. They have different wavelengths. 
So he's like, oh, shoot. Well, that's great that they're away. That's a little nerve wracking. I don't want to go against Newton. But like a wave of what? This is a wave of water in my splashy pool. What's the wave of light? It's like they bring back the ether. But it's interesting. I read a textbook from like 1840. And it's like, if light's a wave, then this is what it is. If light's a particle, then it's like this. They weren't obsessed with the ether at all. It was just like, huh, if, if, we don't know. We're not going to go against Newton here. <laughs> and we still don't know what to do with polarization. It's still confusing as hell. And then in 1845, um, William Thompson, the guy who became Lord Kelvin, met Michael Faraday, who's at this time quite old. And they started a friendship. Um, Faraday lent him a book. He wrote a book back, said, thank you for the book on Avogadro. Really appreciate it. By the way, there's been an experiment I've been thinking about. Can you change the polarization of light when it's in, it's what's called the dielectric medium, when it's in heavy glass, which slows down the light so much? And Faraday writes back. He's like, I don't know. I'm going to look into it. <laughs> like, immediately. <laughs> runs back to the laboratory. He's like, okay, can I change light with electricity or magnetism? And he shines a light beam off of something at a, an extreme angle to get only one polarization. He puts it through the glass. By this time, they had this uh, filter made of two pieces of these Icelandic spar. So it would cancel out the light. And he found that a big magnetic field would change the polarization of light. And he's like, this explains for the first time, I think, that a direct relationship between light and electricity and magnetism. Then I think it was the very next year, he was supposed to introduce a talk for his friend, uh, Charles Wheatstone of the Wheatstone Bridge. And actually the uncle, who hired uh, Oliver Hepheside for mm. talk. I mean, these people, there was only a few people. They all knew each other. They all interacted. Anyway, so Faraday was supposed to introduce this talk. And Charles Wheatstone, who had a fear of talking, freaked out, ran out the back door, and was never seen from again. Well, he was seen from again, but not during the talk. And Faraday who practiced every, who was so careful, who numbered every paragraph, had to fill in an hour with no prep, which was not his style. He was a very careful, prepared person. So he goes up there and he starts talking about Charles Wheatstone, electricity and time and whatever he, he was going to, he stretches, right? Like you're giving a talk, you're like, stretch. And then he says, let me tell you the vague thoughts in my mind. And he's, if you, re it, I highly recommend you read this. It's like thoughts on ray vibrations, like three pages long, zero equation. And he is so like hesitant because Faraday did not like to jump to conclusions. He's like, basically, look, I'm just spitballing here. Because I have to fill the hour. But I've been thinking, what if you had an electric object or a magnetic object and another one, and they're separate? You can think of the lines of force from one going to the other. You move one, it moves the other. You move the other, it moves. Do you see what I mean? They interact with each other. And he said, isn't it possible that light is a vibration of electric or magnetic media. He wasn't sure which. Electric or magnetic media vibrating on one side that causes a wave in these electric lines of force, magnetic lines of force. So he said, or gravity lines of force. He was very open-minded <laughs> and makes the other one vibrate. And all he wanted to do, he said, that way you don't need the ether. 
Hmm. I'm trying to keep the vibration, but remove the ether. And everyone said, fascinating. I still think your lines of force are folded. There are no equations here. It's no good. Hmm. So your statements of like, at the time, they felt like it needed math. And what their big problem was, so imagine you have a north magnet and a north magnet. And you put iron filings there, right? You can imagine sort of lines coming out of both the north, but they kind of curve away, Mm -hmm. right? You push these magnets together, the lines get tighter and tighter together. That's sort of what happens with the thing. At the time, they're like, yeah, but that has nothing to do with magnetic force. That's just a weird go-inky dink. And thinking that has to do with magnetic force seems against the rules of magnet and electrics. That's even worse. You're saying that you rub a balloon and well, they didn't really have rubber balloons, but you know what I mean? You rub an object. Glass, they're, they're mostly object. glass tubes at the time. Glass. Yeah. Oh, they use glass tubes a lot or whatever. I mean, they did have sort of rubber, but they didn't have, well, they had sort of balloons. I think Faraday invented some sort of balloon, <laughs> but anyway, so you rub two objects with the same charge. You can imagine the lines coming out of them, like the two Norths. And Faraday said the force between them is because those lines can't cross. And they're like, that violates Coulomb's law. That's terrible. This is horrible. That's why they hated it. They weren't upset about the ether. They were upset about lines of force not being in a straight line because it just didn't make any sense to them. And then in 1853, a young man named James Clerk Maxwell wrote William Thompson and said, hey, I want to attack electricity. What should I do? Should I read Faraday or should I read Ampere and the Mathematician? Because they seem like they're in conflict. And Thompson said they're not in conflict. They're saying the same thing. They just don't understand each other. And Maxwell said, aha, I haven't done any experiments in this, but I'm going to add some math. So he wrote his first paper on Faraday's lines of force. And then he had some, on the second paper, he was like, he came up with this other model and it it allowed him to get Faraday's law of induction. He's like, oh, I'm almost at having an electromagnetic wave here. I'm almost there. I just need to add a term to this one equation. And he didn't know how to add it. So he kind of changed the meaning of the letter. It started out as something called a magnetic in- intensity, this charge over area. And then he says, no, it's a displacement. It has to do with the di- displacement of the molecules. And the displacement of the molecules, changing that is like a current. And everyone went, oh, displacement current has everything to do with the material. Well, how does it work in the vacuum? And he's like, well, it's the ether. And everyone went, Oh my gosh, in order to believe Maxwell's equation, you have to believe in the ether. It's a requirement. So when they were looking for the ether, they weren't looking for the ether because they believed in the ether. They were looking for the ether because they believed in Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell, between his 1855 paper and his 1861-62 paper, changed his meaning because he didn't know how to add this term that he really wanted to add. And he's coming up with all these amazing things. And you can't climb a mountain the best way the first time. So luckily, because of that, they start doing all these experiments, like the Michelson-Morley interferometer experiment. And they try to find an ether. They try to find if light goes faster one way than the other way when you're on Earth. And they find out the light doesn't add up. And um, Lorentz goes, oh. Well, maybe light doesn't add up. And that's why he came up with his rules of relativity, the length contraction, the time dilation, stuff like that. And then Einstein in 1905, that was 1897, I'm going to go with. And then 1905, Einstein's like, I have a funny idea. What if nothing can go faster than the speed of light? Then nothing is really added. It's not just light that doesn't add up doesn't go faster nothing can go faster we just don't notice it because nothing's going um at the you know so fast that we notice it but if it goes faster 
then you start to see these time dilations and length contractions, whatever. Now, at the time, Einstein, Einstein liked to jump to conclusions, man. He just read Lorenz. He didn't read Michelson Morley. He, I, I read this interview of him from the 50s, and they asked him, they're like, what about Michelson Morley? He said, oh, yeah, I hadn't read it at the time. So I would have, would have referenced it. He just read one paper and jumped to conclusions. He did not go into the history because sometimes scientists do that. But most of us need a lot more backing. But that was Einstein. He just went out there. And uh, Lorentz, who was truly devoted to ether, loved it. One of his early backers. He's like, that's pretty cool. Max Planck loved it, hated quantum, uh, the idea of taking his quantum idea seriously, but loved relative. Well, loved is a relative term. I mean, invited him to give a talk four years later. It was a slow burn. But then they became best friends, and then it fell apart because of the Nazis. But anyway, <laughs> that's a big story. So, so it was not, it was the ether was a big deal because of Maxwell's misunderstanding, trying to fit this equation in there and misunderstanding about it because he still left it. If you look up the displacement field, what's it measured in? It's measured in coulombs per meter squared. It's still a charge per area. But you can find books where they say it depends on the medium because we get so confused because everything got so convoluted that we we keep on looking at the big picture before we look at the the details of how we got here. Because Maxwell was a brilliant guy, but not the greatest writer. He's confusing. So. He really is. I can say that as someone who's worked through all of his papers on this. He's confusing as hell. And by work through, I don't mean read from cover to cover. I mean go through his major equation. Because reading cover to cover is dumb. You get confused. You stop focus. It's not dumb. Sorry. You get confused. You stop focusing on what's important because people make weird assumptions to get to what we think is the right conclusion. And if you just focus on the weird assumption, you miss what they got to. So I don't know. I mean, for me, and then, like I said, um, Philip Leonard was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing. And then, um, oh, so then there was general relativity. Then right after the war, there was this um, guy in England who did a study of a solar eclipse, and he found that the light from the solar, uh, the light from the stars near the solar eclipse were slightly displaced by the mass of the sun. And he's like, ha, huh, proof of general relativity. And everyone went crazy. And he, Einstein was on the front of a recover, and Philip Leonard went crazy too but sort of in a Nazi way, not sort of, completely in a Nazi way. And suddenly science became super political, but it often was super political. We forget that. People like believe Leibniz over Newton or Newton over Leibniz because they were in England or, France, or Germany. Mm -hmm. Like, just like, what? <laughs> Go for the idea, not the country of origin. But no, we're, we're people, we're political people, all of us. We have biases, we have issues. So anyway, there were, pl I'm not saying everyone against general relativity was a Nazi at all, but I'm saying there was a huge Nazi contingent. And then there were other people for various reasons who didn't like it because they felt like it violated Maxwell's equation, the spirit of Maxwell's, Maxwell's equation. Mm. And I think that's okay. You know, like later on, uh, they came, um, it was who came up with Heisenberg and, um, God, now his name is, um, someone else, <laughs> other people came up with the uncertainty. Mm. And Einstein hated it. He's like, and Max Planck hated it. And Schrodinger hated it. Lots of real, Good scientists hated it and never liked it and never accepted it. But it continued to be able to explain phenomena that we had and predict new phenomena. And there was a Solvay Congress. There was a big international meeting. And 
Einstein and Niels Bohr, and Niels Bohr is a delight. They were best buddies and they disagreed on this. And every day Einstein would come to Niels and say, here's why uncertainty is wrong. And then Niels would think about it and debate. And then, okay, no, no, this is why this doesn't work. Einstein said, darn it. And then he'd come up with another thing, another thing. One time Einstein came up with this idea, really stumped Niels Bohr. He was like, I can't solve this one. I know I can solve it. I know uncertainty is correct. I just don't know why. And he went to bed. And in the morning, he comes rushing in there. He's like, Albert, 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 I know why you're wrong. You're why you're wrong. It doesn't work because of relativity. And I just, I was like, oh, no. And he showed him his thought experiment of like why uncertainty doesn't work was foiled by Einstein's own theory of relativity. He was like, no, it's terrible. But it was, it's because it was political in this world with the rise of Nazis, who then took power, it became away from the scientists who could freely argue it. Like Einstein and Bohr, they disagreed on uncertainty completely for the rest of their life. Best good buds loved each other. Just thought and brilliant people who knew their physics, it's, I feel like we think, oh, well, Einstein was wrong for rejecting it, or Einstein was right in this case for rejecting it. And I'm like, what do you mean he was wrong? He was right. He believed it was wrong. He had his physics reasoning that was legit. There's nothing wrong with that. That is science. And if you are a good scientist, you want people to come at you with their legitimate objections. Because it makes your concept so much stronger. And you want to know if you're full of it. You're convinced you're not full of it. But if someone comes to you with legit, you want to say, no, this is why it works. No, this is why it works. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm wrong. And that's good science. That's, that's what you want. And I feel like what happened was the whole ether debate got wrapped up into Nazi politics, which is gross. I mean, the Nazi part. Oh, yeah, have you ever heard the whole thing of like aliens built the pyramids? Mm, mm-hmm. You know, how could we not comes- at this point? Now and then, yeah. yeah. Huh? I said, how could we not have at this point? <laughs> yeah. Do you know where that comes from? Uh, is it the Nazis? Yes, it's the Nazis. They're like, Nazis. wait a minute. How come the Germans be superior in everything if the ancient people had pyramids? And we didn't. Good German people had no pyramid. But those gross brown people did. That must have been aliens. And you're like, really? You're going with aliens over race? I've always thought there's like a little, there's a little strange undercurrent uh, of colonialism in a lot of these ancient people couldn't have achieved these technologies. We actually have a guy coming on the show really soon I'm really excited for who's... Uh, you know, because there's all these arguments on the internet, like ancient people couldn't have built these incredible, they couldn't have machined these huge blocks so perfectly and all of this. And this guy has a YouTube channel where he reproduces those using hand tools. And uh, so I think that'll be really interesting. But but also okay. like there's a big a co- part of science is this is the best, most logical model to explain this phenomenon. That is a very big part of it. We can make up a weirdo model that might work right we can say fairies come in there and magically teleport but that that's not there's no reason for that to be true but it might work it might it might work and it might be predictive is the thing right i mean this is kind of how i see relativity personally and i mean there's good evidence for this having been in the case in the past right like with the heat with the kinetic theory of gases and heat right you can model heat flow as a fluid You can actually build engines using that. It works really well, but it's completely wrong. Heat's not a fluid. We understand that now. And I feel like relativity is kind of in that boat for me right now, where I'm like, this is absolutely predictive. It describes the phenomenon, but it's not the basement layer. We still don't have an understanding of how these atoms are pulling on one another. I think there's two things going on there. The first thing is that it's not a great idea to try to get rid of a model 
with uh, the only good new models come new discoveries are not created they're found that's a better way of saying i've never seen a model in history and i've studied a lot of the history that was formed i mean they tell us that's a scientific model you have a theory you do an experiment you convict it is true never happens that way and really i mean almost never happens that way and never happens that way with the theory i mean that's what philip leonard was trying to do he's like i hate the ether i'm not calling i'm not it's like, i hate the ether i'm going to prove it's wrong and all he did was drive everyone crazy but if you're just looking around at different science you will discover something new and you may end up finding a new model for the ether but it won't come from trying to deny the ether in my mind because that's not how historically ideas are developed they're not developed by cuz we have a model and it works really well so the only way to find a new model is when you're walking down the street and you're thinking about how the wire heated up the water and you're thinking about how your teacher said that water is made of molecules that are vibrating around and the hotter they are the more they're vibrating and you're like huh maybe heat is a form of energy it's not this destructive thing but if he had aimed to destroy the heat indestructible heat theory he would have gotten nowhere cuz all he would do was wind himself in the theories of heat and if the theories of heat are wrong you just spiral Yep. Do you see what I mean? A hundred percent, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of really interesting points in that story you told. Uh, one being when you said that uh, Faraday was giving this impromptu presentation and he, he was like, well, it could be these lines of force and so that allowed him to do away with the ether. And my interpretation, if I heard that lecture, would be like, oh, well, you're just giving structure to this ether. You're actually proposing a structure to it, which is really interesting. And then there's another point where like, you were talking about the Michelson-Morley experiment. Oh, well, you know, there wasn't this drag, essentially. And these ether models assumed that the ether was separate from the atoms that were bathing in it. And so the, the out natural logical conclusion of that study to me is that the ether isn't separate from the atoms and that the, that the ether structure is rearranging when the atoms move around. So you're not going to be able to detect it separately from the atoms themselves. But instead, the conclusion is that it, it, it just isn't there. There's no mediators whatsoever. I find that to be a really bizarre conclusion. I think the whole idea is Sometimes in physics, you have to go with the simplest answer that explains things. And I'm, I'm thinking about the 1911 Solvay Congress, the first mm. one. So there's this guy named Walter Nurst. He was a chemist trying to discover how to get nitrogen out of the air and put it in the ground so he could use it as fertilizer. And he comes up with this idea that you can't reach absolute zero. It's there, but you can't reach it, no matter what. You can do a lot of stuff, but you can't reach it. It's called the third law of thermodynamics. This one form of it. That was his form of it. One of a couple forms that he had. And he came up with that because of some chemistry models that he was looking at. He's like, the way they're curving, I think you can't reach absolute zero, no matter what you do. And he's like, oh boy. I better get some backing. I better get some backing. I better get some theory that helps me explain this. So he starts looking around and he finds a 1907 paper by Einstein about the um, heat capacity of solids. Uh, how much heat it takes to increase the temperature of a solid by one degree. And according to this, the heat capacity at absolute zero is zero, which means it doesn't take any heat to get it out of zero. And so Walther goes to visit Einstein. He's like, I better check this guy out and see if he's a quack. He goes there, and Einstein by this time is a professor. Everyone hates him. No one talks to him. He's nobody. But then Walther nurse visits. They're like, this guy better be something. Hmm. Walther nurse visits. And Walther Nurse says, this guy is Boltzmann reborn. This guy is brilliant. So, 
What does Welfare Nurse do? He says, we should have a big meeting. We should have a big international meeting, make it all about Einstein, but not pretend it's made by me. So he's like, I know this guy. He's a sucker. His name is Solve. He has all these BS theories that no one likes, but he has lots of money, lots and lots and lots of money. So we'll convince him to have a big meeting and we'll invite every important international scientist there is. And we'll let him give the keynote speech and we will all nod along and then ignore him because he doesn't know what he's talking about. And he talks to Max Planck and Max Planck's like, shouldn't we wait a little bit and make sure this is a little bit more developed before we do this? And Walther's like, no, we're good. We're good. We're good. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. So they go there and they have this meeting. And Einstein, meanwhile, is really freaked out about um, quantum mechanics. He's like, it doesn't work. I'm stuck. I'm so stuck. <laughs> but he's like, I have to go to the meeting. I'm the star talker. <laughs> I'm like, and there I am. So he goes there and he gives the talk. And there's a guy there named Rillion. I can't remember his first name. Who is not a believer in this. And they just keep on talking about how many examples this quantum idea works for. That they can't explain any other way. When you have different things of light, it makes these, and you look through a gas, you burn a gas, you look through a prism, you see beams of light, you don't see a continuous rainbow. That explains that. There's something called the photoelectric effect, it explains that. There's something called the, which Philip Leonard had a previous model that was very popular, but didn't work that well, to predict anything. It explains why when you have something that absorbs light and emits it, it always admits lower frequency. And there are other things that explain that couldn't be explained any other way. And at the end of the meeting, this one guy looked up and said, well, I guess we have to deal with discontinuous discontinuities in motion, hard to say, something we had no idea a few years ago. And I'm thinking, Einstein knew about it way long time ago. But the only reason they put up with quantum mechanics, it was reluctant. They're like, this is awkward. This is ugly. And actually, there was a guy at the conference named Ernest Rutherford. Have you heard of Ernest Rutherford? Mm -hmm. Another curious, delight. Yeah. Papa Rutherford. Love him. Big New Zealander. When he first went to England, he wrote his girlfriend back home. He's like, everyone's so mean. I'm about to do a Maorian. How do you say that? A mayor? How do you call Ma the native people of New Zealand? Maori. Ma um, that one's hard for me. Maori. I think Maori. Maori. A yeah. Maori war dance on their chest. <laughs> like, I'm going to kick their ass. I can just imagine Rutherford as a young man. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Stop being such an asshole. Sorry. So, but he said, after I gave a talk, they all just shut up. <laughs> he really was brilliant. And he hated theoreticians hated them he's the he just like he, i think um heisenberg came for a talk and he's like okay i guess that's interesting bye <laughs> oh he's at the Soviet congress he's he comes back and he's like i guess that was something and he tells it to his grad student whose name was niels bohr hmm. now niels bohr was the only theoretician that rutherford could stand partially because Niel bohr was so delightful that no one hated him. And partially because Niels Bohr was a really good football player, soccer, and uh, Rutherford's like, well, I know he can't do experiment, but at least he can hit a ball. So, like, I like him. He's a good, he's a good bloke. I'll put up with him. <laughs> they really loved each other. Um, anyway, Niels Bohr was like, I see it. I see what's going on. And I don't think we can explain what's going on with atoms without it. See, the problem with atoms is, Rutherford had discovered or had a theory that the nucleus was had most of the material all smushed up and therefore had to be positively charged. And the electrons are tiny. So what keeps the electrons from sinking in the middle? Right? Like there's nothing there to hold it in because all the mass is in the middle. So there's no mass holding it out, right? And if you spin, a spinning is a kind of acceleration so that should admit radi um 
radiation and that you make it spiral in and boop, boop. like that's why people didn't like the nucleus model they're like well it can't work it can't work or everything would just implode and Niels Bohr said I think it can I and do you know how he made it work he said well sometimes the electron things just don't work the way you expect them to Mm. He literally said that. He's like, okay, the bottom thing, which is like it's spiraling in the ground state, it doesn't radiate energy. Why? Because it doesn't. Seriously, that's what he said. His biographer called it the most audacious thing in physics. He's just like, it just doesn't. And he wrote to Rutherford. Uh, this wasn't the only thing he assumed. And Rutherford's like, it's interesting, but this combination of classical and quantum is really confusing. And and so he was like, but Bohr said something else. He said something else that was even more outrageous. And what he said was the energy of the light was not the energy of the electron. It was the change in energy. And those two ideas that electrons don't work the way mac macroscopic things do. And the energy that it produces is not related to its energy, but it can change in energy, is what makes that such a profound difference in our understanding. And the reason it was accepted was because, well, first, he was had all these theories that wasn't working, and someone asked him, well, how does it work for the hydrogen line? You burn hydrogen, it makes these lines in a set pattern. And he was like, oh, the hydrogen lines, I forgot hydrogen made lines. <laughs> And so he's like, okay, the hydrogen works like this. My equation will work like this. And he had an empirical formula, a formula that just came from experiment. And he could derive it from his theory and from fundamental constants. And even better, there was this one weird spectrum from this one weird star with only every other line. And he showed that it could work if it was helium with only one electron, not two electrons. And when Einstein heard about it, as a person who was there said, a friend was visiting, uh, actually a friend of Bohr's, and he was visiting, and I'm uh, forgetting his name, and he said that when Einstein heard about the, um, the helium lines, he says, oh, it, he said, Einstein's big eyes got even bigger. He said, it must be true. The energy, I had those thoughts, but I wasn't brave enough to say them. The energy hasn't, doesn't have to do with the energy of the electron. It has to do with the change in energy. And later on, he said, in his autobiography, he said, I thought it a miracle then, and I think it a miracle today. There is great musicality in that sphere of thought. And that's why we put up with the quantum BS. It's because it worked for experiment and we can't find anything else that works as well. I think that it's not a question of arguing with the efficacy of the math because that obviously works. The only question is, do we, do we have the best possible visual material model for the, do we have a material model for the atom? No. And that's that's the challenge. I'm like, I think that it's that's possible. That's the title of our book. That is like we're the, we're trying to approach it from the standpoint of I think it's possible to imagine a material that gives you all the quantum weirdness. Like you take everything as it is. You change nothing. Everything is like you're not challenging relativity. You're not arguing with the mathematics of quantum mechanics. You're just saying, is it possible to imagine a substance that would give you these results? And what would that look like? What causes gravity? Well, okay. So in our, uh, you, so if you take the radial distribution function of the atom, it says that of the electron of the electron, it technically says that an electron can be found at any distance from the atom. Gravity? No, no, no. I'm saying the atom. So if you take the the radial distribution function oh. of an atom, the, oh, no, I was asking a electron. different question. What causes gravity? I know well, this is important. Uh, like to I guess it. like. So in order for us to explain gravity, we have to explain to you, we have to build a, a physical model of the atom. 
because fundamentally gravity is caused by atoms pulling on one another. And oh, so okay. I what see Anastasia what you mean. is going to do for you is build out a model of the atom that allows the atoms to be connected to one another physically. I understand. Okay, let, let me just back up for a second because I I'm trying to think of the right thing. Physics can make rules for how things sh we predict how things should go, and we can adapt those rules. And sometimes we extend those rules. Sometimes we change some rules. Sometimes we realize rules only work in certain scenarios, but they cannot answer. In one way, they can answer why. But eventually, you will always get to an answer question of why that you cannot answer. That's Gödel's incomplete theorem, yeah. I don't, I've, I, like I told you, I'm not a philosophy person. The only thing I remember is it's a snake that eats its own tail. <laughs> Gödel is a mathematician, and he basically formulated the idea that your model can explain to some basement, but you cannot go below the basement. And so no matter what model you have, you will always get to a basement that is your starting assumption, and your model definitionally, axiomatically, cannot explain your starting assumption. Right. And so for me, what's joyful about physics is that it explains, I'm a very tactile person. That's why I was like, I don't care about black holes. I don't care about dark matter. And I feel like I can hear physicists grinding their teeth if they're watching me. Like, no, you have to love what I love or you're not a physicist. But to me, I'm allowed to love what I love. And what I love about physics is how tactile it is. Mm. I love how, I love how it, it, it can, I love, and that's why I love waves so much because they are such a weird combination of the ethereal and the practical, the tactile and the invisible. And like, I, I started studying radio waves. And I'm like, Gosh, radio is so magical. We don't think of it as magical. We just think, oh, you turn on the radio and listen to it. And I swear, I bet eighty I bet eighty percent of people think radio is sound waves, which is not true. It's a, a visible light wave. Um and it was discovered to prove Faraday Maxwell's law. And that's why it made Faraday Maxwell's law so exciting. Which is why we got so into the ether. So it wraps right back into the ether. But I feel like what you're interested in is like trying to look at the philosophy of how we look at equations. And that has its own interest, but it's not my interest. I, I, I can see why you like it, but for me, it, if it's like the stuff with the dark matter. I don't have the time to look into it, and I don't really like it. Sorry. Well, no, I'm it's so fine. Sorry. It's fine. It's fine. I think that I guess that the, where I'm coming from is I'm like, uh, the way that you treat stories in physics as being your mechanism for for wrapping yourself in the subject, mm -hmm. for me, it's mechanism. Like, I did my PhD in bioelectricity. Mm -hmm. and. Ooh. So I basically was studying the way that these redox molecules were being used inside of bacterial biofilms to communicate over long distances. It has all these really interesting implications for the origin of multicellularity, for the nature of complexity inside of these single-celled organisms. Okay. But I was studying the interface between these molecules and what's called the electron transport chain inside of the bacterial respiratory system. And all of this has to do with charge, and it mm -hmm. has to do with oxidation and reduction of chemicals. And when you start to dive into what does it mean for this molecule to carry an electron, what changes about the molecule? Because mm -hmm. it's not like a little bead that's floating around. We know that that's an old model that's very effective, but it's not a model that's realistic. Like there's mm -hmm. no there's no electron bead that's floating around that's being passed through places, and then you start to look at these, uh, at the proteins that are inside the electron transport chain, and you discover that they have all of these so-called reaction centers, and the reaction centers are these metal ions that are complexed inside these these trampoline like resonating chamber looking 
structures and they're separated from one another by some distance and yet the electron is able to travel from the phenazine molecule to the various cytochromes of the, the 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 electron transport chain by jumping from this reaction center to reaction center mm-hmm. and when you're like because I'm writing my thesis and I want to start at the beginning and I want to be able to tell the story of how this happens. And so you right. get to the basis of it and you're like, how is this happening? And they're like, it's quantum tunneling. And you're like, what does that mean? And mm-hmm. they can get, you, you can get a mathematical equation. But I am, not, I, am, I am in the Faraday camp of physics where I'm mm-hmm. like, I need you to tell me a story of what is happening. I need you mm-hmm. to tell me what this molecule is doing as it touches the protein and what happens in the protein and what are the shape changes and what are the motions that occur that allow it to transmit information that powers life, that powers everything that we do is is locked in the sequence of like seven proteins. Mm-hmm. And when you ask the biologist how it works... They're like, the physicists have it. And you go to the physicists and you're like, please tell me what is the nature of charge and what, how quantum tunneling actually works. And they're like, I don't know, it's weird. We have the math though, and so we know that it works. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, come hell or high water, I will tell a material story for everyone who is like me and not like you. Because you go into the, the, the papers and you see the equations and you're following the equations. And I'm like, I need you to tell me a story. I need you to tell me a story of what the stuff is doing. Because without that, I cannot say that I grasp nature. I cannot grasp life without being able to understand the reactions at the heart of life. I cannot call myself a biologist. Because I am, I am pawning it off on the physicists and saying, they get it. They have right. an equation for it. And I'm like, they don't get it. And no. I want, and and that's the that's the ceaseless drive of this project. Where I'm like, look, it is a philosophical preoccupation. I will not argue with that, but I think that it is a philosophical preoccupation that belongs at the heart of physics because the math without the philosophy is just half the story. Like, I, I've I've told the story before on the podcast, and I'm 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 trying to hone how I say it. But I'm like, imagine that we go back in time, and the people who are studying heritability are mathematicians, and they're like, we have a perfect equation for the way that traits are inherited. And there's a genetic field at the heart of every cell, and that genetic field informs heritability. And we can predict it really well, and we can work with it, and we can manipulate it, and we can build accelerators that allow us to study it. And that's just where it ends. Like, it's a field. Do we ever get molecular medicine? Do we ever get CRISPR-Cas? Do we ever get immunology? Do we ever get uh, the, the genealogy that's on the basis of genome sequencing that is fundamentally shape-based? And I'm like, I think we get a lot of other stuff. I think we get fantastic mathematics. I think we get incredible algorithms. We probably accelerate the way that we program machines. But do we get the like bare knuckle biophysics? I don't think we do. Or if we do, it's like hundreds of years delayed. So I have to tell you something that I think you will really like. In 1857, Michael Faraday, who's quite old, wrote Maxwell letter and he said, I think that when a mathematician comes up with a new theory, they have to explain it to the rest of us. They have to get it out of its hieroglyphic, neither above nor below the truth, so that we might experiment upon. He said, you, when I talk to you, I cannot follow all that you say. And mind you, at the, I, this is me side commenting. At the time, Maxwell had just started his equation. Like, I don't know how he explained it to Faraday, who was completely math phobic. And I really wish I could have heard this conversation because I really wanted to know what he had to say. Anyway, side comment. Anyway, he told Maxwell that, like, when I talk to you, you can explain it to me in a way that I don't necessarily follow all the derivations. But I know what you are saying, and I know what you mean. And this is a bit of paraphrasing, except for neither above or below the truth and the 
hieroglyphics. Beautiful letter. Faraday wrote in the most beautiful thing he'll be freaking crying. Um, and yes, yes, mathematicians, and we don't do that because we are scared of being wrong and we don't know how to start. But in my mind, where we start is where it came from. Because if we try to make models that explain things with that we can either, if we have a math, mo math model, we can explain it where we're like, here's where the math comes from, but don't worry about these middle steps. I'm just trying to give you the big picture. And that's important to do. And I do that a lot. But also, it is hard to do that unless you really, really, as they used to say, grok it. You got to get it forward, backward, left, right, center. It is so much easier to explain it with math than to explain it with concept. And that's the, that's the thing that we're driven by right now, which is that the math is there and there, and there's no contest that the math is accurate to an astonishing degree. I, yeah, the, the, the trick of the puzzle for us is really taking all of the math that we encounter and folding it into our material representation of, of fundamental reality and giving visual animated pictures for how the atoms are producing these magical effects. It's very much a puzzle solving system where we're not trying to propose a new physical theory. We're really just trying to integrate them all into a material representation of reality, so that, which is de which is missing, so that you can move past the hieroglyphs. Because I think that there is like a tendency. There is there is a schism. There is the people that are able to read the hieroglyphs, and there are the people that can't. And when you talk about that fear in people about physics, where you ask a student to tell you if seconds are time, distance, or speed, and they freak out, it's because the knowledge is parsed in hieroglyphics and. Right. I, there was a fantastic Twitter thread the other day, which was, uh, it was like this guy was making the point that people have a really weird fear of numbers. And I'm going to butcher the story, but he was like, okay, so if you have a card game and you have uh, blue cards with odd numbers on them and red cards with even numbers on them, and you have some fraction of them that you need, how what's the minimum number of cards that you need to turn over in order to test the rule of which one has blue right. and even or red and odd or whatever it was? And most people answer, and they answer incorrectly, of like which card you have to turn over. And then he right. tries it again in a different formulation. He's like, okay, so you're in a bar. And wait, 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 wait. I want to guess. I want to guess. Well, I and to, but what the question is, do you know it or do you start to see the pattern? No, so you have three. Sorry, blue... I want to answer the question. Yeah, 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 okay. So you have three. Go ahead. Blue don't, cards. don't tell me the Twitter thing. I'm sorry. Yeah, let me tell sorry. it to you correctly. So you have three blue cards. Oh no. Hold on. Let me find let me find it. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll find it and then we can come back to it. I mean, the the interesting thing is just that there is this there's this hole that doesn't fit into the philosophy schools and doesn't fit into the physics schools. And it's a really interesting little niche of of understanding where we have these like beautiful, empirically defined and predictive mathematics, but we don't really have a material basement for how these interactions take place. And you know, we, we actually, we've just been, this was a curiosity for us. And um, we, we got, to, we've gotten to know a lot of people uh, over the years. And um, we were actually hanging out with somebody who, who is actually a very famous physicist. Um, he wants to remain anonymous, but he, he was listening to some of our ideas and he was like, have you guys published this? And we're like, well, I, I don't think you can really publish this anywhere. It doesn't fit into the physics journals. It doesn't fit into the philosophy journals. And I'm talking about our specifics of, of the architectures that we're proposing. And he was like, "Well, you need to write. You need to write a book about this, and uh, and I'll pay for you to write this book because it's so mm. important." And so that's that's how we ended up doing this. Actually, that's how we ended up in this strange orphaned situation where we're, we're trying to address a problem that most people don't think is a problem. And so, I don't know. There, it's there's just an interesting gap because I think this is why I was so excited to talk to you is because it seems like there was a moment when people stopped worrying about how it happened. They, they, they wanted to say ex there's, how and why are very ambiguous words, but they weren't so much interested in the mediation of these phenomena, as long as they could accurately describe them, as long as they could make predictions using those quantitative descriptions. The sort of why was, uh, was at some point just a completely neglected enterprise. And that's, that's a really interesting decision that humans have taken. 
in terms of physics? I think that why is never, I mean, why does it work? But how the, the, what's underneath the basement is not usually the question for physics. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's okay. I think that, but I don't think it's okay that we don't tell people where these equations come from. I don't think it's okay that we teach it like everything is obvious to us. We don't think it's okay that we have so little, we're so anxious about our own ability that we don't admit that we have a pretty, there are certain people who study physics for a really long time. We actually do know a lot. We just, we're nervous that someone will know that there's things we don't know about or things we aren't interested in. I mean, I swear, I must be the only physicist who's ever said out loud that I'm not interested in black holes. I mean, like, I've never heard a physicist say that in their entire life because either one, they're really interested in it, or two, they're like, you're supposed to be interested in it. And I'm, you know what I'm saying? Well, I think they're interesting because they don't make sense. And that, and it seems like ripe, fertile ground for development, right? It's like something's happening here. We don't really understand it. And what could possibly be causing this? It just intrigues people because it seems like it is this open field to be developed. But see, that's the opposite of what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in people saying, oh, you think... I'm interested in knowing deeper and better and simpler and cleaner because my main interest is to give people, get people to this basic level of understanding because in order to use physics, you have to understand the basics of it. Mm -hmm. And then to order to understand if you want to get further development in, you need to believe in the, ba you need to get to the basics. And so one of my biggest things is to try to convince people who are experts to have a little bit of belief in themselves so that they can admit when they're confused, mm. when they're surprised, when, they're, and so they can go, when you can do that, then you can better explain things to way. And when you get it wrong and you said, I was surprised by this. And then you say something and then someone else says, Oh, you know what? You know what? You're surprised because <laughs> you got it wrong. You go, Oh shoot. You're right. I got it wrong. And it's a delight. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a professor at Stanford and I was talking through things and I was, I was actually driving over there and I'm like, okay, I'm going to give him a list of things in order of how how controversial I think they'll be, right? And because I want to see where he thinks I messed up. I'm not being like, I'm not using him like, oh, he really, I'm just saying like, I want to see if he thinks I made a big error, if it makes sense to him. But it doesn't mean it's true. It just means sometimes it's good to talk to a colleague. So I'm going through this list, this, 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 and he's like, yep, 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 yep. And I pause and I like, I kind of thought you'd have more objections here. I have all these arguments. He's like, no, nope. makes sense. But it was funny. One part of it, he looked at it and he says, well, that doesn't work if the, if the magnetic field is constant. And I'm like, oh, oh, I forgot this. Oh, my gosh, I forgot this. Lead. Oh, my gosh, I forgot the EMF. Ah! And I was so grateful for him to point it out. Because that's why you want to talk to colleagues, to be like, hey, I don't need you to be like my, this is true because someone famous said it was true. It's like, I need you to be like, hey, am I being an idiot? <laughs> Number one, am I being an idiot? Like, am I even possibly making sense? Because peer review doesn't have to be peer review paper. It just means reviewed by peers. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then second, can he find any things where I'm like getting a little ahead of my skis? Oh, I forgot that thing. Oh, no, I didn't do that. And lastly, is what you're doing clarifying things or, or adding complexity for no reason? And for me, the history 
And my new philosophy of being honest about what surprises me, what scares me, what confuses me, what bores me, is what gives it power. And what helpfully helps it, like if you watch my videos and you see how the science developed, I think, you know, as best as I can tell, then I feel like from the, the history gives it a story. The history makes it a grounding. The history tells you what was founded on BS and what was. I was talking to my therapist and she said she did her PhD on me. Oh, anyway, uh, I'm probably not supposed to. <laughs> anyway, she was talking about the, the form about the different mental health things and how it's hard to understand it unless you know where it came from. I'm just wondering if I'm supposed to talk about that or not, because it's not my stuff. Anyway, she was talking about that and about in, in psychiatry, not, not saying I'm rejecting all traditional psychiatry or I'm accepting all additional psychology. But if you hit something that irritates you, you go back to where it came from and you see what of it makes sense to you, what of it doesn't make sense to you where it came from, what you like, what you hate. And that allows you to grow your knowledge and help other people get a better concept. Yeah, because you, then you, you can see the, the forest for the trees and vice versa. Did you look up the Twitter thread? I did. I found, so it's actually, it's a well-known, it's called the Wasson Selection Task. So you have four cards mm -hmm. and each card has either a number on one side and a color on the other. Mm -hmm. S the visible faces of the cards show three, eight, blue, and red. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what cards must you turn over in order to test if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue? Oh. Um, two. Mm -hmm. Which is was, which ones? Sometimes I'm good at that, <laughs> and sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm like, "Oh, I'm smart," and then I'm like, "Oh man, I missed it." I just wanted to, you turn the co two colored one, no, so or they, the two face ones, either one. No, so you have but to turn color ones. is you have to turn the eight card and the red card. Oh, because either one of those will violate the the rule, right? If you turn over the red card and mm -hmm. it's an odd number, or it's uh. But Sorry, I think that test if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is blue. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, if you turn over the red card and it shows an even number, then it violates the rule because even numbers have to show blue. And if you flip over the eight card and it's red, then it also it would violate the rule. So you flip over the even one and you flip over the red one to test to see if the rule is true. I got okay. the right number for the wrong reason. <laughs> right, exactly. But what's funny is that they found that if you do it in a social, so if you change the formulation of the problem, and so, okay, the problem is this, you're in a bar, and you're the bartender, and you know that there are, there's four people that you're looking at, and you have to test their IDs to see who is drinking illegally, and you have somebody who looks like they're 50, you have somebody that looks like they're 20, and mm. you have uh, somebody that, and then you have, you know, two IDs or whatever. Like, wh whose ID do you need to check to make sure that nobody underage is drinking? Hmm. I don't know. I lost that one too, but that's okay. But the, I, the, I see what you mean, but putting it in context makes it so much easier. It's, it always does. And that's my thing. And that's your thing too, honestly. Okay. So he, the, the context is this. So you have, you have four, you have four cards and uh, each card has either an age on it or a drink on it. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure that you, which cards do you need to turn over to make sure that the people who are the proper age are the ones that are drinking alcohol and the ones that are the proper age are drinking soda. So if you're below 21, you're drinking soda. If you're above 21, you're drinking alcohol. Gotcha. And so in this case, you have four cards, 16, 25, soda, and beer. What uh, are the gotcha. So what are the cards that you have to turn over in order to check to make sure that nobody's 
drinking the wrong drink. I'm sorry, my brain is full. Well, so I know t- it's supposed to help. It's okay. I'm sorry, it's just my brain is full because we've been talking for three hours and 15 no, no, minutes. No, it's, it's, to- it's <laughs> totally fine. The point is, is that you know inherently, if you saw it in front of you, that you have to turn over the card. You have to look to see who's drinking the beer. You have to check the person who's drinking the right. beer to make sure that they're over 21. And you have to check what the person who's 16 years old is drinking because the 16 year old can't be drinking it. And so when you put in context in the social place, when you have a story that you tell, all of a sudden people can answer the question and they can't answer it when it's just numbers. Right. Like the rates at which people successfully answer it changes. And so it's important to have the story. That's the, that's the bottom line of it is that if we don't have the stories and we don't have the context, I think that we lock a lot of people out of being able to think about physics because it's so, it, it, the stories aren't there and you can come at it from the history. You can come at it from the philosophy, but I think that the project at the end of the day is to be able to make more inroads for people to understand the fundamental ways that nature melds together to produce the things that we see. It's. I agree with you on everything. I just, for me, philosophy doesn't make it simpler. It makes it more complex. And, and that's, that's that's just a different view. Yeah, that's exactly. not right or wrong. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, like, and maybe I think that for we some people, the it. history makes it more complicated. We just come at it from different directions. But I right. think that what we're coming at after is the same question, which is, why is it like this? Right. And the or why history. Do you think it's like this. Exactly. Is what I'd prefer. Why do you think it's like this? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And so it's just, it's been super illuminating and there's nice. so much to think about and so many references. And I, I really hope that we have the chance to talk to you again in the in the future as we develop the, the historical side of things. Well, I'd love to hear more, especially if you figure out like the history of the spin. I think that's a fascinating story. I've never heard anyone going into that. And I just think it's a gold mine of fascinating things for everyone like all these physicists are like this is a spin how do we know that i mean i bet you you interview a hundred physicists ask them about the connection between ampere and spin they won't know it because we don't learn our history i would i would i would agree with that (laughs) so i think that would be a, a fascinating way to go and i would love to know more about that and i've loved so much I really do want to inspire people to look to where things come from because I think it really does expand our understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you're doing a great job of it. So, so keep it going. And uh, Thank yeah, thanks, thanks again for giving us all this time today. And it was lots us, of fun. It was so lovely to meet both of you. Good luck with your project. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. you as well. All right, have a great yeah. rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Folks. Thank you. Bye.